again, I'm going to say a very warm welcome to everybody who's joining us for the inaugural Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland Public Patient Involvement Event, which has been organised in collaboration with the patient advocacy organisation Sjogren's Ireland. So um, we've just gone through a little bit of housekeeping, and I'm just going to uh, move the slides on to show you uh, what exactly is uh, a knowledge exchange event. So our objectives for this event are that you participants would learn more and comment about the Sjogren's research findings from the last year's uh, Sjogren's Syndrome event in 2021. So we really want to impart that knowledge uh, to you through Dr. Joan uh, Nigam Drumgul, who's the lead academic researcher on Sjogren's in RCSI. And we want to hear your response uh, to, to Joan's findings. The, the second objective is we want to welcome clinical specialists about brain fog and dental care in children's syndrome. And we're very pleased that these experts are um, uh, offering their time and their expertise to the community that has gathered here today. So we really encourage you to uh, listen closely, take notes of what you would like to hear more about or uh, any questions or comments that you might have for the speaker. So um, you can jot them down and then in the Q&A session, there'll be an opportunity to share. We also want to hear from you in terms of your own lived experience, your own knowledge and your, your needs around what should we be thinking about for future public patient involvement research activities? So um, Joan is very keen to co-create the direction of the, the research cluster and uh, uh, informed by yourselves as people with lived experience. And then uh, finally, um, uh, Sjogren's Ireland, who's represented here by the founder, Deirdre Collins, is very interested in hearing your experience, knowledge and needs around a patient advocacy organisation to plan future supports and activities in the future. So um, uh, the final thing I'll say about the knowledge exchange event is that it is only a knowledge exchange event if it is two way. So please do use the chat function to introduce yourself. I would welcome you to start introducing yourself in the chat now if you're comfortable to do so. Let us know who you are, where you're coming from. If you're representing an organization or an institution, it would be really helpful to us if you could uh, press rename. So that's the three dots over your name. And you can just put your institution in brackets if you're representing an institution or an organization. That just helps everybody uh, know who's, who's in the room. So I hope that's all clear. And um, I'll just move on a slide here. Um, so uh, just to let you know about the schedule, uh, in a moment, um, we're going to hear from Professor Tracy Robson, who is the Professor and Head of School of Pharmacy and Biomolecular Sciences. Um, and once uh, Tracy has uh, given her welcome address, um, then we'll have a presentation from Dr. Joan Nigam Drum Ghoul, who is the founder of the RCSI Collaborative uh, PPI Research on Sjogren's. And then we'll have a good 20 minutes for discussion and questions. And after Joan, uh, myself and, and Deirdre will say a few words about our involvement from the perspective of PPI and the patient advocacy organization. We'll then uh, have a 10 minute break at 11 o'clock. You'll be happy to hear. And then when we come back, we'll hear from Dr. Sabina Brennan, who's a neuroscientist and psychologist with great expertise on brain fog. So really looking forward to uh, Sabina's presentation. Again, we'll have 20 minutes uh, discussion and then we'll have a break at 12.50. Our final speaker uh, spoke at last year's event, Dr. Eleanor O'Sullivan, and she's back by popular demand. And she's speaking on dental care and her talk will be from 1 to uh, 1.20 or 1.30. And then there'll be a good 20 minutes for questions and discussions as well. And then we'll uh, wrap up with a couple of closing words and an opportunity for a group photo if that's something that uh, people would like. I'm going to move on now uh, to introduce someone who's just been absolutely um, uh, pivotal to the development of the uh, collaboration um, to Sjogren's Syndrome and, and PPI in RCSI, Dr. Joan Nigam Drumgool. And Joan uh, has led out on a fantastic initiative in the university and she'll be sharing with you uh, some of her academic and research background and also sharing with you, importantly, the uh, results from last year's event. So over to you, John. Thank you, everybody. Um, welcome to everyone who registered and everyone who has attended today. Um, and I'm really excited that everyone's here to be involved in the discussions and collaborations. As Lorna said, I'm the scientific lead of the Ocular Immunology Research Group here in RCSI. 
Um, and very excited about the partnership that's developed between um, our researchers and the uh, Shorebrands Advocacy Group. I'm actually going to move on and uh, introduce our um, first invited speaker. So I'm delighted to be able to introduce Prof Tracy Robson, who is one of our distinguished leaders in RCSI, and she's going to launch the RCSI PPI Ignite Knowledge Exchange event. Prof Tracy Robson is the professor and head of the School of Pharmacy and Biomolecular Sciences here in RCSI, University of Medicine and Health Sciences. Prof Robson is passionate about PPI. She's passionate about educating the next generation of healthcare professionals and driving innovative research that will transform healthcare. Thank you, Joan, and thank you, Lorna. I'm really honoured to be here on this beautiful sunny morning uh, to open this inaugural RCSI PPI Ignite Knowledge uh, Exchange event. I'm just delighted to be here to open this event and very proud that this has been led out by uh, Dr. Joan Nigaun Drumgu, uh, who is from my own school and we work very uh, closely together. So, so well done, Joan. So last year, RCSI became the seventh university to join the PPI Ignite Network, which really aims to enhance public and patient involvement in research. This network is supported in RCSI by our uh, PPI manager, Lorna Kernan, who you've already heard from, and our new PPI academic lead, Dr. Michelle Flood, also from the School of Pharmacy and Biomolecular Sciences. So as a school, I'm really very proud that they were leading on uh, many PPI activities across RCSI. So I guess what do we mean when we say PPI and public patient involvement in research at RCSI involves patients and members of the public really working in partnership with research teams to determine research priorities and, and how best to carry out that research. And as a health sciences focused university, RCSI recognizes the importance of placing the voice of the patient at the heart of its research and education activities. And, and scientist and patient partnerships cultivated through RCI, RCSI activities as part of the PPI Ignite Network will really play an important role in prioritizing the needs of the patients and the public further to drive innovations that transform healthcare and improve quality of life for communities. Deepening patient engagement is one of our main aims. It's really part of our strategic priorities at RCSI, and we've already established, established successful collaborations that involve patients and the public in our research. And as part of RCSI's role in the network, we're also trying to identify new and sustainable ways to bring the patient voice into the center of the research we do and the education we provide. And we're here today as a result of the successful partnership between Shrograns, patient advocates and researchers from the Ocular Immunology Research Group here at the School of Pharmacy and Biomolecular Sciences at RCSI. And last year, their partnership saw an innovative approach really taken to developing a platform to reach out to those living with Shrograns in Ireland. And, and really this came about because of a lack of a charity or a support group. And it meant like it meant that you know groups of RCSI researchers, just like Joan, uh, could not really directly inform individuals with Shrograns about their research, and nor could they have patient input into the research questions they asked. So Joan, who is a scientific lead of the Ocular Immunology Research Group, has a special interest in autoimmunity and has been researching what is causing the immune system to function improperly causing the uncontrolled inflammation associated with Sjogren's syndrome. And Joan and her team believe that increasing our understanding of Sjogren's through research will help to find ways to control this inflammation and potentially lead to improved diagnosis and better treatment options. And in addition to their molecular studies, the Ocular Immunology Research Group have also investigated the quality of life of individuals with Sjogren's syndrome. And during the course of these investigations, they became very acutely aware of those affected by Sjogren's syndrome. It were really a very much underrepresented group who experienced significant delays in diagnosis, mismanagement, and a lack of support. So help to support and empower those living with Sjogren's to become their own advocates. The Ocular Immunology Research Group here at RCSI hosted the first Sjogren's patient information online webinar 
on World Sjogren's Day in 2021. And the research group were able to identify Deidre Collins and Dorothy Kennedy, who helped raise awareness about the event through sharing their disease journey publicly. And Joan and her group were incredibly fortunate and Deidre Collins to agree to help organize the webinar and inform on the research studies that the group were hoping to include at the event. And having Deidre on board as an event organizer and expert speaker really helped to increase the relevance and impact of this Shrogan's event by tailoring the content to more accurate, accurately reflect the needs of patients. And the webinar last year was informed through establishing key relationships between researchers and patients. It was supported by RCSI across many departments, including PPI, the comms team, and RCSI design, in addition to having support from CF Pharmaceuticals, who provided their webinar platform. And forming these um, and maintaining these partnerships is essential for events like this to take place and really to ensure the success of future patient forced events. Thus, I think with the goal of collaborating with patients to improve healthcare, today's event, Joan, Deidre and the PPI team will share with you the results from the surveys that many of you participated in last year. And additionally, we hope to share with you the impacts and initiatives that have grown from their research patient relationship and show how working together can enhance the impact and value of our efforts. And that means that today, as attendees of this knowledge exchange event, you will have the opportunity to discuss and participate in the exchange of ideas between researchers, children's patient advocates, and the RCSI PPI team, really to help shape research and improve healthcare. And you'll also have the opportunity to hear from two uh, amazing guest speakers, Dr. Sabina Brennan, who will discuss brain frog, fog, not frog, and Dr. Elna O'Sullivan, who will discuss dental care for those living with Sjogren's. And speakers that have been chosen through consultation uh, with patient advocates. So I really hope you find this event informative and engaging. I hope that you all have your fans blowing at home or wherever you may be to keep you cool whilst listening. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time to attend and I really hope you enjoy this event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Robson. Um, thank you for those lovely words and a, a, a lovely launch of our event. I am just going to share my slides now. So today I'm going to share with you some of the results from our patient-informed research in Sjogren's Syndrome. And when I talk about patient-informed research, what I mean is the research that we um, put together with the Sjogren's Patients Advocates last year with the support of the um, RCSI PPI team. And it's about public patient involvement. And for me, that's the patients informing the research that we do, helping shape those questions and helping make sure that we're, at, we're asking the right questions, the right tone, um, and that we're not... Um, Deirdre will tell you, make sure that we're not having too much screen time, that we're using the, the right language. So it's really important to ask the right questions and make sure that we're only asking the ones that are relevant. Um, so basically, I'm hoping that we'll give you back the results from the surveys that many of you participated in last year and give you an understanding of how, with your help, we've been able to generate Irish-specific data. So up until now, all of the data that I, myself as a researcher, or probably yourself as patients, have come across have been related to studies in the UK or in America. And while there is credible information out there, it isn't accurately reflecting the picture of what happens in an Irish context. We have a different Irish healthcare system, and there are, so therefore there are different needs. Um, and also, sort of some of the things that we think about Sjogren's syndrome are. Um, that they need to be changed when we think about it in terms of the age of, of onset um, and when it happens. And we want to talk a little bit about terminology as well. What, what would you like, what we should we be calling the condition as well? Um, so with your help, and because you were participated and answered all the surveys and listened to all my reminders, we're able to generate infographics like this. This is Irish specific data. So it's telling us that there's an estimated prevalence is between 0.5 and 1%, um, that it can take between five to 10 years from the onset of symptoms to diagnosis. And that's quite long. When if you look at the English data, you're looking at maybe two to five years. So it's actually a lot longer than in, in other countries. And again, the age of onset is different. We often think of it as postmenopausal, so older women, but here we can see that it's actually a, a lot younger. So we found from our data, again, that it was younger people. So from the 30s onwards, um, were um, sort of telling us that that's when they were first showing symptoms. 
So this uh, survey stemmed from the webinar that we start, established last year. So we wanted to have an event where we invited people to come and participate. I and mean, we also wanted to hear what you had to say about the quality of life as those living with Sjogren's syndrome in Ireland. We did an online um, survey after and we invited everyone to help us and um, participate through the studies to raise awareness, to increase our understanding of the condition, um, to direct research questions. And ultimately, we're hoping that if, if we were able to establish a community of Sjogren's patients, that we'd be able to ultimately provide mutual support to one another in that context. And um, so after um, the event, we sent out some surveys and these are what I'm calling patient informed research studies. So this involved the patient advocates meeting with myself um, to talk about what questions we wanted to ask um, and how many questions should appear in the survey and the types of language. And we went through like every aspect of it, the ethics forms, the consent forms that you would have seen um, and the various different questions. And it's really about making sure that we asked the questions that were important um, and what to get the information that would help researchers and both the patient advocacy group find out what the picture is of Sjogren's syndrome um, for patients in Ireland. So the first survey we sent out, we sent the survey to everyone who registered, 209 people registered um, and 76 people took part in, this, in our surveys. We had questions relating to demographics and diagnosis. Um, there were questions related to the impact of COVID. Um, we also wanted to generate um, a graphic that talked about the main symptoms. Um, of Sjogren's syndrome. So that was the word cloud um, that we created. And also we did some standardized questionnaires. You may be familiar with them or you may not. And I'll discuss them in a little more detail on the next slides. And also, because we didn't get it perfect the first time, we had a follow-up survey where we were thinking everything had gone online and we really wanted to get a sense to understand how that in, had impacted Sjogren's patients in terms of cancellation of appointments or how they felt remote appointments or online appointments um, had worked for them um, during the pandemic. I just want to point here to remind myself that um, our PhD student in our group, who's an ophthalmologist in the Royal Victoria Eye and Ear Hospital, is responsible for analysing the data that came in from all the surveys um, and for doing all of the statistics. So I've used that then to make the figures that I'm going to present um, throughout this presentation. So I just want to say thank you to Dr. Emily Greenan. Um, so the first data we're going to talk about is related to demographics. So we can see from those who participated, we can see that 97% are female and 3% are male. And that sort of fits with um, the statistics that are out there, that Sjogren's affects women nine times more than it does men. And then what was particularly interesting for us is the age. So we asked people their age. So 52 years seems to be the average age of the people who responded um, and the range though was from 40 to 62. So we can see that it's sort of different to what's been out there in the literature, that it's not strictly, you know, a, um, a disease of menopausal women, that it can actually occur earlier. And I think that's something to be, to be aware of, to be cognizant of as we educate the next generation of healthcare professionals, but also those currently in practice as well, to be aware that symptoms can present earlier um, than the, the, than the associated with the menopausal years. Um, we actually, I don't know if our polls are going to work here, but um, so the data, we really wanted to get a sense of, um, in terms of diagnosis, and again, it speaks to like awareness around the condition and um, your, the physician awareness and their knowledge um, of Sjogren's syndrome. We wanted to, we asked, did you get a diagnosis of primary Sjogren's syndrome? Did you get a diagnosis of secondary Sjogren's syndrome? Or did you just you, you get an unknown diagnosis? And you can see that half of those who responded were told they had primary Sjogren syndrome, 3% or sorry, 9% had been given a diagnosis of secondary Sjogren syndrome and 33% um, had a diagnosis that was unknown. Um, I might attempt to stop sharing my slides now and see if we can do the poll. Thanks so much, um, I've, just, uh, I've just tried to launch the poll. Yeah, here. that's great. Yeah, yeah, that's working. Fantastic, that's great. So I just encourage everyone to uh, click on those three questions. Maybe Joan, if you can see them, perhaps you could read them. Yes, out. thank you very much. Yes, so the first question was, do you know what primary, children, primary and secondary Sjogren's means? I mean, for, for in clinical background, maybe in a research background, we might, might know, but do you know what it means when your physician says it? Do you know what the distinction is? Um, there's also a movement now to sort of maybe move away from using the terminology primary or secondary Sjogren's, and we'd like to know what would you prefer Sjogren's to be called? Sjogren's syndrome, Sjogren's disease, Sjogren's, or, or maybe 
you have no preference. Um, so please indicate that there first. We're really keen to know how important it is. Um, for, do you think that it is for, to have access to Irish statistics, Irish information, and Irish resources for showgrounds? Um, so if you could indicate there whether it's very important, important, not very important, or it doesn't matter at all, um, that would be great. Um, Thanks, Joan. People are just putting in their final answers perfect. now, and I'll end the poll and everybody will be able to see the results. So just uh, pop in your final answers and I'll, I'll hit end. Perfect. I'll just speak a little bit to about, about the, well, maybe, maybe we might open it for discussion then after we get, we get the, um, the results in, in terms of the primary and secondary, we'll see what, what, what comes in. Okay. So can you see the results there now? Yeah. So we have 76% are aware of what it means when clinicians are, are, are aware of what it means when it's referred to as primary and secondary showgrounds. Um, maybe 17% um, aren't aware and 7% just they don't know. Um, so that it's so there does seem to be a good awareness around what is meant by primary and secondary showgrounds syndrome. In terms of preference for what to call the condition, um, it's pretty much even split across the board. Um, so it's about 25% for Sjogren's syndrome, 32% for Sjogren's disease, 20% for just Sjogren's on its own, and then a 25% have indicated they have no preference in terms of terminology. Um, we might open that up a little bit and um, when we talk about uh, why this is an issue and why we've asked that question. Um, and one of the, the next question then, oh, let me scroll. The next question is, how important is it to have access to basically our specific data? And overwhelmingly, 75% have agreed that it is really important to have our specific data. Um, and then we have 20% uh, who agree it's important. And um, so I guess that sort of speaks to the need for us to continue the, the campaigns around awareness and increasing education. Um, do we want to stop here and check in the chat box what people think around the primary and secondary Sjogren syndrome? Because that's I know great, that's a great idea. If you just stop sharing your slides for a moment, Joan. No problem. We can go back and if people are happy to turn their camera on um, and raise your hand if you'd like to kind of join in the conversation with Joan there for a moment. And Jeremy, do you have some comments? I'm just wondering would anybody like to um, come on screen? So I think there's some really good observations. So Debbie has said um, that she reckons that the, the terms are no longer to be used. So um, maybe people have already moved in, in that direction. Um, and that also, and I think it's a great point, is there's you know some differences around the use of syndrome and disease. So would anybody? You're doing a great job. And I'm so happy that finally, uh, you know, this is happening in Ireland, to be honest. I'm a long haul of this showgrounds business. So anyway, that's another day's work. I won't disturb, but thank you. Oh, thank no, no, lovely to hear from you. Thank you so much. No, I'm, I'm literally, when I saw it on your, on the smart patient on the screen, I honest to God, I actually thought I'd, I'd won the lotto, and that's been honest. So I've had years of this Shogun's business. I'm a long veteran to it all, and I am just so happy. Do you know what I mean? And I'm a retired nurse, so I know I know the system. I know what can be done. I know what can't be done, and I've um, you know been there. Anyway, listen, I won't disturb, but listen, fantastic. Thank Great. you so much. Thank you. Um, I just in, in, in lieu, if anybody else who wants to come on and will want to raise their hand, I'll just say in terms of the, the terminology around it, um, it was sort of pointed out to us, and it's, it's, it's known in the literature as well, that it can sound exclusionary. That primary sounds like that's the condition that's getting the most focus, and then secondary is, is secondary. And also, I think in terms of conditions and research, um, it's been shown that a lot of patients with secondary Sjogren syndrome are excluded from them. So in case of a treatment, that has been shown to work in primary Sjogren's syndrome. We don't know whether it will be as good or effective in secondary Sjogren's syndrome. Hello. Um, Hi. It's lovely to be here today and meet all my Shogi friends. I was diagnosed in the Lupus Centre in London with primary Sjogren. I'm non-serum uh, testing now, uh, and, uh, but not at the time of Lupus Centre. And I also had the rheumatoid factor. They don't have a problem with me having Shogun syndrome, nor does America. I was over in America yeah. in 2019 because I have a rare neuromuscular disease. What they say is that they did, they accepted the diagnosis and they said my twin was actually in the beginning of the, the disease process while I was more advanced anyway. And I now have to link in with a UK rheumatologist. She's lovely. 
but I don't have, I've been trying to get a rheumatologist for seven years. My issue isn't with the fact that I have or do not have Shogun, because I do. I do not believe the lupus sense will get it wrong, no. more America. I also believe that we rely heavily on the testing for Shogun's rather than, you know, it, take a broader look at it and because non-serum patients are then being completely ignored. For seven years, trying to get rheumatologists has been appalling. And having to webinar to or to Zoom to UK to get advice has been very difficult when I have other conditions to deal with as well. I don't mind what it's called. I do mind the awareness yeah. of both uh, medically diagnosed through testing and non-serum, which is recognized in most countries because it, is, it does happen. And that's where we are, I think, falling down. We're accepting biopsies and all these sort of things before you ever treat a person or care about them. I think that is a little bit ignorant. Oh, yeah, I 100% agree. And we have other studies that show you should listen to the patients, the patient's voice. It's, it's, it's more important than actual the clinical science. So, um, and I'm, I'm appalled that your disease during has been so horrific and you've been so badly managed. Um, but I think that's why we were talking about the, the, the difference. For us as researchers, uh, funding bodies um, and, and studies like people to be in a little box. So you're very well characterized at, at, for primary, secondary, but that does mean that those with secondary shorebones are sort of uh, not included in studies um, as much. Um, our research group, we do is improve it, Is it a fully recognized disease here in Ireland? Secondary shorebones. Any shogun? Oh, yeah. Do we rec yeah, we recognize it, but I think, that, um, and that's part of the reason for the advocacy group and, and this and this campaign is to raise awareness. Like it's recognized, but I think it's probably there needs to be more awareness. We need to raise awareness among healthcare professionals. And um, I find that the patients are incredibly and um, well informed, um, and it's often that we find that we need to up the level of awareness among the healthcare professionals, and that's part of what we're doing here through our patient information leaflet. Um, our website and the future initiatives that we're planning. But yes, yeah. the next question we asked, and it does seem, maybe it seems slightly um, similar, but we had asked um, basically time since diagnosis, how long have you had your diagnosis? And we can see that almost half of people had their diagnosis for maybe five years. But what was a really, the next question that we asked, which for us is very important and informative was the time from your first symptoms to your diagnosis. So that's the time when you're being undiagnosed, you're having all these treatments, these disease symptoms, all the damage has been done to your organs and you're not being properly managed or effectively treated. And you can see there's a range there of um, uh, years that people are, have been um, non-diagnosed. So we have from one year up to 10 years. And that's part of the, the information that feeds in now to our system that we need to raise awareness about this, that there is a significant number of patients living with organs in Ireland who are not being diagnosed quickly, which means we're not treating them effectively. So I wanted to ask patients um, this question because I've seen it a lot in the literature and I wanted to have the Irish data. So I wanted to know, um, and also the Sjogren's uh, group as well, we asked patients what disease symptoms impacted their day-to-day -day life most. And we collected their responses and made a word cloud. And you can see the bigger the word, the more um, this, this symptom is given back to us. So we can see that fatigue is appearing quite big, dry eyes and dry mouth are appearing big, but you can also see other ones there, vaginal dryness, brain fog, muscle pain, neuropathy. This speaks to another point that we were finding that patients were very frustrated about the fact that people just say dry eye and dry mouth and you're relegated to they are your only symptoms. We now have a map to show, no, there are a whole host of symptoms. So more than others, but there are a whole host of symptoms that are associated with this condition. We need to be aware of this and treat it more holistically rather than just focusing on dry eye and dry mouth. And um, so that's again, something else that we'll be focusing on as we go forward. Um, I don't know if our questions are going to work, but in the chat box, if you would like to jot down, do you see symptoms here that are similar? Are you are, is there, are the symptoms that you have most day to day reflected here in the word cloud, or is there something that, that isn't reflected? Um, if you want to just pop that into the chat box, um, and I'll go on to the next slide, which sort of gives the breakdown of percentages. 
So thank you to everyone who uh, participated in studies and uh, didn't get annoyed at me with all my reminders. What this has done for the first time is we now have Irish specific data. I can now say it in my grants, in my papers, we can say it on the Sharpen Syndrome website. We have numbers and data on, on what it and what actually greatly affects patients or those living with Sharpen's in Ireland. So we can see the percentages. So dry and dry mouth are quite high percentage wise, but we can see fatigue is quite big. There's a lot of patients who are suffering from fatigue and joint pain. So we now have these numbers. We can go back and say these are areas that need focus. We need to be aware that patients are also have these symptoms as well. So it's impactful having this information. And just that survey, just that word cloud was able to generate this. And that's incredibly impactful for um, the, the researchers and from the patient group as well. So in the interest of time, I'll just move on to the, our next slide. We wanted to know about from participants of the studies, if they had had patients um, appointments cancelled or rescheduled, because we were interested to get an insight into how COVID um, during, during the pandemic was affecting patients' um, treatment and care. You can see that a significant number of patients had their appointments either cancelled, delayed, or rescheduled. And we were interested then to know who, what types of appointments were the worst affected. And we can see that there's a lot of, um, we have rheumatology, dentistry, general practice um, there. So rheumatology, 60% of patients had a rheumatology appointment um, affected. 32% had dentistry or general practice appointment affected, and 22% had um, ophthalmology affected. Others included um, physiotherapy um, and uh, dietitian appointments. There's a, a, a whole host of other appointments then that were affected. We wanted to, what I wanted to know and was to see is if having those patients those appointments affected affected your care or affected the overall quality of life of those um, living with children during the pandemic. The first standardized questionnaire that we used is called the Euler Sjogren Syndrome Patient Reported Index, or as we call it, the SRI. I don't know, some of you may or may not be familiar with this. You may have completed it already. And the idea behind this is, if you look at, and I'm sure you all, or some of you have, if you look at the various different studies, it's very hard to compare one study to another. And even as researchers and scientists, we can't. So the, there are two indexes that were developed that are supposed to be, enable me to compare my study with a study done in the UK or America, and this is one of them. So if the patients fill out this report questionnaire, they get a score, and I can compare the scores from the Irish patients with those from the UK and America. So it's a very nice um, index. And the idea behind it is it measures the three main symptoms of Sjogren's syndrome. So we have dryness, fatigue, and pain, and it's measured on a scale from one to 10, with one being no pain or dryness or fatigue, with 10 being the worst pain, dryness, or fatigue imaginable. So we can see here on the, uh, at the scale, we have kind of moderate pain in around five and anything above them we're into moderate to severe. So we have a score of 6.6 .6 for dryness and fatigue and a kind of a, in, the, in the moderate um, score. Yes? Joan, sorry to interrupt. Uh, you just have three minutes left. So just Perfect. to let you know, thanks so much. Perfect. Um, so, and then uh, a moderate score then for the pain. The next one we asked was in terms of your mental health during COVID. And this is a specific question that was developed. It was it's fantastic resource to find. And what came out, so here, the higher the score, the more COVID impacted patients during uh, the pandemic or infected their, their mental health. And we can see that the highest scores were people felt that their quality of life was lower than before. And they felt that their physical health may deteriorate. We did recommend that anyone who felt these symptoms or felt their worsening of the mental health contact their GP. Um, for, for additional supports, but it gave us a really good snapshot of, of how patients were being affected by the pandemic. And one of the last ones we asked was called the TUC, or the Telehealth Usability Questionnaire. And the idea was to give us a sense of how you felt your appointments went when they went remotely. So it goes from strongly disagree to agree. So the higher the score, the happier people were with remote or, or virtual appointments. Um, so this is busy, I apologize, but we try to cut down all the questions and we try to pick the most important ones. So the little boxes are around the things that are important. Overall, it seems that remote appointments were um, seen as being beneficial. People liked the remote appointments because it saved time uh, going to appointments um, and they would use them again. But obviously, um, I'm probably not too surprised that it's not the same as actual real life virtual appointments. But as a, an addition to something um, and as an addition to care, I mean, it's something that we could definitely supplement patient care with. Um, we found that patients in Ireland 
didn't suffer as much as other patients in other countries with interruptions to their um, medication. And that was pointed out to me, maybe because the pharmacist continued working the whole way through. And in other countries, there was uh, issues with access to Plaquenil, which we didn't seem to see here in Ireland. We did see um, patients saw a worsening of their dry eye and dry mouth symptoms by wearing masks, which probably would be linked into why the telehealth appointments were so well received, because you didn't have to attend appointments and wear masks for prolonged periods of time. Um, we asked, again, what areas you think are important? What do we need to do to improve your medical, hair, medical care and treatment? What came out strongly? Effective therapies and diagnosis, but really strongly, um, nearly 60% of patients told us that we need to increase physician education. And we're going to discuss a little bit later the initiatives that we're putting in place to do this. But this, these awareness campaigns, these webinars and other events are what we're hoping to do to do that, uh, to achieve this. Um, but obviously, uh, I can do, we can do effective therapies and diagnosis probably through our research. We will need patient consultation and collaboration to come up with ideas for how we can improve um, physician education. Um, I just, I, I don't know when you're about to pop in, I, I can talk here to say that we um, have heard your, your voices and what we've been able to do in terms of um, raising awareness among patients and physicians is um, we've generated the first Sjogren's syndrome information leaflet, specifically um, with data for and information for um, patients in Ireland. It's also for patients and healthcare professionals. So this resource is um, available to anyone for download on our website. And it has also really importantly got information from patients. So your voice is there too. So the advice that patients would give somebody diagnosed is there too. And it's, it's got healthcare information from everyone who's very generously given their time and expertise um, to help develop this um, key healthcare resource, which you can find here on our uh, Sjogren Syndrome website, which we've co-created with our Sjogren's Patient Advocates. And um, so all of this um, information is there. So you'll have updates on what's going on with the Sjogren's Patient Advocacy Group. You'll be able to find out what events that we're doing or updates on our research. And also in this tab here, you'll have all, all of the resources, everything that we're, we're um, generating to help raise awareness and support care will be in this, this box here. Just to, I suppose, uh, share with people here that the Royal College of Surgeons is part of a national network. It's a very exciting network. And we have Martha Killalay with us uh, from NUIG today. And NUIG uh, in Galway is leading out on the PPI Ignite Network, which essentially means we bring academics and researchers together with people with lived experience of, of different healthcare conditions, as well as family members and caregivers to understand really uh, from your perspective, what, what should we be researching? So that's a, a diagram just showing there's lots of opportunities for people with lived experiences to get involved in the research cycle, not just as participants giving data to researchers, but actually as partners. And that's why this uh, collaboration has been so very powerful between Sjogren's Ireland and Joan and, and the RCSI team, because it's very much a partnership and, and a co-design approach. Next slide, please. Thank you, Joan. Um, so that's uh, those are some images of the people in, in, in the Royal College of Surgeons who are very PPI active. And that's an image of just how many uh, organizations and charities and national partners and researchers are, are involved in the Irish uh, Public Patient Involvement Network. So um, what patients in 21 told us uh, is that they really wanted, uh, firstly, they wanted a patient information leaflet which Joan and, uh, and her team responded to in collaboration with clinicians and with patients. Um, they wanted to join a patient group and I'm going to welcome uh, Deirdre if um, perhaps Martha could spotlight Deirdre uh, now to come on screen. And they wanted uh, support with helping set up a patient group. So that's something that uh, Joan and her team um, have, have been working on during the last year. They wanted, uh, people told us they do want to take part in research and you can see there are 94%. There's a massive interest among people in, in helping research because I think there's an appreciation that good research leads to good healthcare. Um, and uh, there's a lovely interest in helping us design in our future research and indeed in sharing uh, the patient experience publicly, 35%. Last slide, please. And just around that, uh, maybe um, if Michelle wouldn't mind popping um, the uh, podcast link in the chat. This is uh, a wonderful podcast with Deirdre and Joan talking about their experience of the collaboration and, and what it has resulted in. So it's a good 45 minute listen when you're uh, making lunch or something like that. And then the, the last slide is a couple of quotes from uh, patients from 
the last event just saying it was really informative and really helpful. And then I think the next slide is Deirdre's, I hope. So um, it's it's just my great pleasure to welcome Deirdre Collins here to, to speak to you today. Um, I've had the privilege of working with Deirdre and Joan for the last, I think it's been about a year and three months now, and I've really witnessed Deirdre's uh, dedication and commitment to ensuring that all patients with children are served through the new Irish Advocacy Organisation. So I'll hand over to you now, Deirdre. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Lorna, and thanks to everyone for coming. Um, it's great to have so many people here today with children. You can sometimes seem like no one else has this disease, but there are lots of us out there. Um, I know we've stuck with time, so I'm just going to have a quick chat about what Shogun's Ireland is. Um, so a small group of us with Shogun's got really frustrated about how things currently stand in terms of how Shogun's is understood in Ireland. And I think that's a frustration that many here today probably share. Um, we understand the difficulty in finding doctors, finding accurate information, information about shoguns and just trying to navigate the Irish healthcare system. So what we want to do is we want to raise awareness of shoguns. We want to educate medical professionals about the systemic and serious nature of shoguns and that it's just far from dry eye and dry mouth because that's a big problem. Um, ideally, we aim to have better outcomes from initial GP visits, so quicker diagnosis and quicker referral to specialists. Um, and we also hope to improve services for those with shoguns in Ireland. Um, also, an important part of what we do is to form strategic alliances with RCSI and others to further research and best practice for shoguns in Ireland um, and to create a connection between researchers and those of us with shoguns so we can work together to better understand the condition. Unlike the UK and US, we have very little Irish specific data and statistics on shoguns and it's really important we improve on that so that Irish doctors understand our situation better and so we don't have to start travelling as is the case with so many of us. Um, and we're hoping to create a community that can participate in new research, clinical trials, etc. cetera. Um, we were initially focusing almost completely on advocacy and education of medical professionals. We started receiving a lot of messages and emails from people looking for support. So there's obviously a need for a support system. So we've adapted our strategy a bit to look at providing that support community alongside the advocacy. Um, and we have some very exciting developments in the works over the next few months in terms of advocacy advocacy um, and providing support systems for those with children um, and we're very excited to announce it as soon as all the details are worked out. Um, so watch this space, um, find us on social media, we're on Shogun's IRL on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, I'll share them in the chat now, um, give us a follow, keep an eye on what we're doing. We also have an email address, shogunsireland at gmail.com, so do get in touch with us, suggestions, ideas, etc, we want to hear from you so that we know we're on the right track in terms of providing what you need um, so just a, that's pretty much it for me. I was just keeping a brief um, and a huge thank you to everyone who has followed us on social media so far, shared a post, reached out with messages. We really appreciate the support and input. And also a huge thank to Joan and Lorna for organising today. It's great to have such an event on Shogun. So thanks a million. Awesome. And I'll pass back over to Lorna now. Thanks so much, Deirdre. And, and we're conscious we just have eight minutes left. Uh, Joan, if you wouldn't mind, stop sharing your screen and we'll come back into the large room and people can choose if you want to go away for your eight minute break now, or if you'd perhaps like to stay and ask Deirdre a couple of questions specifically about the patient organisation. So let's just see if there's any hands up uh, in, in the gallery or if people would prefer just to take uh, uh, their break. Oh yes, Mary Freehill. So if you unmute yourself there, Mary. No, but yes. <clears throat> I think I've got a voice now at this stage. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for organising uh, today. It's certainly very welcome. Um, as uh, for me, Shogun's was uh, something of a mystery and very difficult to find out very much about. Um, I just like to just really find not to start talking a lot about myself, but just simply say, I don't know if my diagnosis is secondary or primary. I know it's minor. I know that I have Raynard's. Uh, and I expect that this connection between the two, uh, the issue that concerns me most is that it's beginning to have impact on my central vision. Uh, and uh, whether there's any research, I attend by idea hospital, they're watching it very closely, uh, whether there's any research available uh, that I should go after at this stage that could in some ways. Thanks, uh, I'd invite Joan to come in in response there. Thank you. 
Good morning, uh, Mary. So <clears throat> in terms of uh, research on the central vision, we're looking at the, the front part of the eye. We're interested in, in what's causing the, the damage there. Um, I'm not 100% sure if anybody's looking at it, but we can actually look into it and get back to you and, and to see if there's anywhere that we can point you um, for good resources or if there's anybody doing some research in that in that area. That's super. Thanks so much. John. I think it's something to do with Reynard so that the blood is not uh, flowing to to my eyes as my fingers and toes. Uh, I, what you know, what you do about that then is the question. So thank you very much for your response. Thanks, Mary. And Joan's details um, are being posted in, in the chat so you can follow up. Um, and, and indeed, all participants um, are, are welcome to make contact with Joan and through the website also. So we're just going to take our six minute break now and we're coming back break. on the hour at 12 midday for Sabrina. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Joan. Hello and welcome back to everyone. Thank you for coming back for our 12 o'clock session. And before we hear uh, from uh, Sabina, who Joan is going to introduce in a moment, let's just try a, a quick poll um, uh, to inform uh, Sabina around uh, what you think um, health, current healthcare knowledge of Sjogren's is. So I might invite maybe Deirdre or Joan just to unmute and let me know, is that poll answering okay? Yeah, that's perfect. perfect. Lovely, yeah. thank you. So we'll just uh, give you a, a couple of minutes there. So the first one is who first suggested Sjogren's to you as a possible diagnosis? Was it a GP, a dentist, a rheumatologist, an optician, an ophthalmologist, online media, or friend or family? Um, it's very helpful for Joan and the RCSI team to understand what uh, other health professionals should be invited to become a part of the collaboration and the research cluster. So thank you very much for your replies there. And you can take multiple ones uh, if you wish. Um, the second question there is, in your experience, do healthcare professionals have a good knowledge of Sjogren's? We've just offered you a single choice there, and we can already see that uh, most of you are saying no, unfortunately. So it's really wonderful to be joined by two healthcare professionals today who do have a very uh, good knowledge of Sjogren's and who are leading the way in their respective fields. The third and final question is, how often do you experience brain fog? Um, is it never or occasionally, often meaning once a week, or very often daily or most of the time? So I can just see uh, people are still filling it in. So we'll just give it a uh, uh, half a minute more before I end the poll. And uh, Joan, you might like to unmute and, and begin to introduce um, and, and spotlight, uh, spotlight Sabine. Thanks so much. Um, so it is my great pleasure to introduce um, our first invited guest speaker, Dr. Sabina Brennan. So Sabina Brennan is a chartered health um, psychologist. She's a neuroscientist by PhD um, and host of a Super Brain podcast and also best-selling author. Um, her books on beating brain fog um, and 100 Days to Younger Brain are Irish Times number one bestsellers. Um, Dr. Brennan employs cutting edge neuroscience to reveal the secrets of the most underused resource on the planet, the human brain. Um, in easy to understand and everyday language, Sabina shows how anyone can harness their brain power to reach their full potential. Um, Sabina and her husband and her three dogs have recently swapped their life in the suburbs and their Dublin city for the country life in a 200 year old lakeside rectory where she spends all of her time gardening, renovating and kayaking. Um, but my spare time. <laughs> spare time. Oh, sorry. Did I say all of your time? All yes. Your spare time. <laughs> I wish. Apologies, <laughs> Sabina. <laughs> I suppose, you probably don't have any spare time that, 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 that's the luxury um, and you can um, we're going to pop it in the chat box for you there are ways to follow Sabina and keep um, up to date on, on kind of content and what um, what she's up to so you can find follow Sabina on um, Instagram and Twitter and we are also going to pop in the chat box um, where you can go and find some of Sabina's excellent free resources thank you very much uh, Dr Brennan Thank you. Um, I can't see the poll, take part in it or see the results. So I don't know what's come back in around brain fog. Thanks so um, much, Sabina. So I'll just let you know that 31% of respondents said they experience brain fog daily and another 31% experience brain fog occasionally. So it is a significant oh, issue for people. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. No, it is. It is. It is quite significant. And I experience it myself as a consequence of lots of things. I have to say, folks, this is a fabulous event. I know I'm here as a speaker, but I also am someone who lives with children. Um, so um, it's just absolutely um, 
uh, an incredible event to have the Irish perspective on it and to come across and meet other people from Ireland uh, living with children. In fact, actually, this is probably the first time I've met any other, apart from in a, 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 a rheumatologist waiting room, uh, other people who also have showgrounds. A lot of people often say to you, what? Um, and in fact, my GP, it used to drive me insane, insisted on calling it showgrounds sh sh or something like that. Anyway, it used to drive me mad. I always felt the least you could do was learn actually how to pronounce <laughs> It. Anyway, I digress. I am here to talk about brain fog. Um, and really what I'm just going to do is give an overview about what brain fog is. And I'll try and do it as quickly as possible. And then I will take um, questions um, afterwards. So uh, yeah, what is brain fog? Um, because we're hearing an awful lot more about it at the moment, which I think is probably one of the positives that have come out of the pandemic because it is associated with long COVID. So if I'm taking anything positive from long COVID um, and the, the whole pandemic is that it has shone a spotlight on brain fog and the fact that it can be extremely debilitating. Um, so basically brain fog is just an umbrella term that describes a collection of symptoms and they can be range from just feeling completely overwhelmed, a feeling of mental fatigue, which is very different to the physical fatigue. And a lot of us would be with Sjogren's would feel um, physically fatigued, but sometimes, I mean, I remember when, you know, before I even had, had a diagnosis, you know, feeling that just exhaustion, you know, maybe having headed out somewhere and say, oh my God, I have to come home. And sometimes that was, exacerbated by dry eye but if you have mental fatigue that's kind of different you can't even do you can't do anything because you can't think and um, they're kind of different and I've advocated on international groups and organizations to have mental fatigue classified differently from physical fatigue um, and, and mental fatigue is very much part of um, brain fog and um, you'll have problems um, paying attention and that can take the form of uh, you know problems focusing. So even if you're trying to read a book, for example, um, you might lose your attention, might wander after a sentence or a paragraph, you find yourself going back over that again, that same paragraph to make sense of it. Or you might have have problem um, paying attention to what you're doing because you can't uh, push out the other things that are going on around you. Um, you may experience a slowness. We call it a slowing of processing speed, but what um, uh, you might experience it as is that it seems to be taking you longer than it ordinarily would to take in the information that you're hearing, make sense of it, formulate a response and then get this response out so there's just this general slowing of processing speed which would like be you know it's no different to a slowing of physical speed you know say if you've hurt your ankle or um you know if as we get older it might take us longer to cross a road it's that kind of sensation but it feels very strange uh, when it's processing information in your brain um problems making decisions and often when you say that to people they imagine who don't have brain fog they imagine it, it's things like big decisions which it can be decisions about mortgages or those complex decisions but when you have um brain fog it can be the simplest of decisions i use that i make animations by the way to explain complex um neuroscience and these are all little images from my animations hand up yes yeah, sabina my apologies just one of the participants has asked would you mind speaking a little bit more slowly they're really enjoying every word thanks so much okay sorry i will slow down um so um those problems making decisions can literally literally be as simple as deciding what to wear in the morning. I mean, I used to pre-pandemic, pre I used to travel for you know, conferences and, and speaking a lot. And I, it would take me hours if I had brain fog sometimes to just decide what to pack. I'd be trying to figure out what's the weather going to be like there. What do I have to wear at the conference? Do I have to go out for dinner? Like that was challenging, you know? And I mean, I have challenging job, but it was those decisions that would floor me. Opening the fridge and deciding what to have for dinner, you know, and they're complex activities from a brain perspective. You know, even deciding what to cook, you have to figure out there, that's your executive function because there's a lot of processing that takes place to decide what ingredients you need, what order they have to be cooked in. And when that fails, you those what we think of as very simple tasks 
become beyond us and, and can overwhelm us. And so that's why brain fog can be so debilitating. Um, more common things that people might, you know, be able to put a name on are things like issues with memory, becoming forgetful, forgetting what people have told you. And this is where brain fog can impact on relationships. You know, if your partner tells you something and something important or that they're going away or that there's an event on that you need to be there for and you have brain fog and you forget that they've told you that that can transform into an argument that changes your relationship because they'll say but I told you that last week I told you that was important or you don't love me anymore you don't listen to what I say like people don't you know it, it can sound simple but the knock-on effect to your life and relationships can really be quite big so memory issues language so we hear a lot um, about uh, word finding difficulties. For me, when I've had it, you know, for long periods, my life can be like a game of charades and you can laugh about it, but you're describing things with your hands or it looks like an orange, it's roundy or whatever. And a lot of people with long COVID have described an interesting thing. Often with brain fog, um, you know, you might say a word similar. With long COVID, people have been substituting words that have no relationship to the word they want to say. But in addition to that um, word finding issue is also that your language might not appear as rich or as fluid as it ordinarily would be. So that in a sense changes who you are. Um, and that can impact on your personality, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. And another one that people are surprised about um, is it's a problem that we would call a problem with spatial navigation, but clumsiness, bumping into things, dropping things, overspilling things, slamming doors. And that's because that is brain issue. So your brain is constantly assessing your distance between things, um, you know, how much pressure you need to put on something, you know, how, how gently you have to pour, how near the top, that's a brain function. So with brain fog, that can be off. Um, and, um, you know, so that's one of the symptoms. And of course, there's the fog symptom, you know, the feeling foggy, fuzzy, too tired to think. Um, I can't think straight. Um, I can't concentrate. I can't focus. You know, those very general things. And actually, that's one of the reasons I wrote the book um, was to uh, uh, allow people to tease out what their specific symptoms are, because some people will only have one domain affected, you know, and kind of going to the doctor and sort of saying I have brain fog or I have, you know, a lot of people with brain fog prior to the pandemic were just just getting, you know, gas. Is it gaslighted or gaslit? I never know what to say, but they were really just being, you know, not not given the uh, consideration and 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 the seriousness uh, that they that they deserved let alone their other symptoms um, that they might experience with uh, showgirls now a lot of the things I've described people will have experienced in everyday life you know if you've got jet lag you will experience some of those things if you've been burning the candle at both ends you'll experience those things and um, if you've been overstressed or working too hard you will experience some of those things the difference with brain fog is the symptoms are persistent they occur regularly and they interfere with the quality of your life, your uh, ability to carry out your, your activities of day, daily living, your job, and they interfere with your relationships. And essentially, really, what, what a lot of people will have said when they experience brain fog is they feel like they've lost themselves. They're not who they were. And, and, and like I was expa explaining there, if your language changes, if your processing speed has got slower, if you are somebody who ordinarily is known for their quick wit, that you're the first one in with a funny line or, you know, a, a sharp sense of humor. If you've got brain fog, you can't think quickly enough to do that. And so that almost changes your entire personality. And people will interpret that in various ways. Do you know, either, you know, you're not getting on well with them anymore because you're not funny with them. And, and people tend to take things personally. Do you know, the way you're behaving is something to do with them. And then obviously, you know, there is the obvious um, 
there is the obvious thing that, um, you know, on top of all these things, there's an irritability with yourself and um, a frustration with yourself. And, it, and, and there is the thing that you actually may not, feel, you know, mentally be able to carry out your job. You may be struggling cognitively uh, with your job because of these issues. So it is a very, very debilitating um, thing to experience. Um, and it really needs more recognition. Now, having said that, it is not a disease, it's not a disorder, and it is not a diagnosis in and of itself. Um, but it is very real, and there are, is research done on it, and it is rather the way I would like to describe it. I would put it sort of akin to high blood pressure. You know, high blood pressure is not a disease, it's not a disorder, it's not a diagnosis really in and of itself. It is really a sign or a signal that something is amiss. Something's not right and you need to find the underlying cause. It's a warning sign. So I would say brain fog is a warning sign um, that something is amiss. Your brain is malfunctioning. It's not functioning as well as it should be. It's a signal to take action. And, uh, you know, it is a symptom of something underlying. Now, basically, that thing that can be underlying brain fog that can be causing brain fog. Generally speaking, it's not just one single thing, but I will start with an underlying health condition because I think that's the very first place anyone should look. And obviously we're talking here today, you know, about Sjogren's, but rarely will it be one thing. Uh, and therein sort of lies the solution. There's lots of other factors usually contribute. And that is the way that we can minimize the impact that brain fog can have. So basically, I just want to double check what I have. Yeah. Um, so basically, brain fog can be caused by underlying health conditions. Uh, and uh, interestingly, and of course, <laughs> most of those underlying health conditions disproportionately affect females. And brain fog is disproportionately experienced by females. Um, it can be the side effect of a medication. It can be also caused by fluctuations in or um, imbalance of hormones. Uh, it can be the consequence of dietary deficiency and also can be the result of various lifestyle factors. So if we come to the health conditions, um, brain fog is really commonly associated with a number of autoimmune conditions, obviously Sjogren's, commonly associated with lupus and uh, several other autoimmune diseases, it's very, um, and inflammatory um, conditions and other chronic illnesses. So type two diabetes, Crohn's disease, multiple sclerosis, um, you know, so many of them. Um, and interestingly, so brain fog is the umbrella term. A lot of individual conditions have their own terms. So people with multiple sclerosis, which is, you know, it's referred to as an autoimmune because, you know, um, it attacks uh, the myelin sheets, but it's also a neurological condition um, because, it, you know, it, it affects the brain and it's, it's degenerative as well. But um, they tend to call it cog fog. People with chronic pain of fibromyalgia will call it fibro fog. Uh, there's different names, but the brain fog is kind of the umbrella term. It is also associated with... Um, viral illnesses that's why it's been no surprise and I've been writing about brain fog in uh, and COVID since 2020 and I made a special episode of my uh, podcast in 2020 with people with COVID um, way back then um, but like if you have sepsis um, you're likely to have brain fog for about 12 months after having sepsis so it's it's it's, it's no surprise that it's in long COVID and um, a bacterial infection is common with depression too also and um, some cancers and um, it is also common as a side effect of and, and I'll just go back there to you know with autoimmune diseases inflammation pain they're all interlinked in a way and you know when it comes to Sjogren's we don't know for sure exactly why it can bring about brain fog most likely it's to do with the inflammation um, and we know for sure any sort of inflammation in the brain if there is any inflammation there that that is going to directly impact 
on your brain function, but also there's all the indirect ways that that can impact on our brain function, you know, such as disrupted sleep and um, pain that it can cause and um, anxiety associated with it, with, you know, having a condition, especially if it's not going to be diagnosed properly, you don't know what's wrong with you, uh, depressions associated, lack of exercise, various things. So there are multiple factors that come into play. The medication, unfortunately, the medications used to treat many of the conditions associated with brain fog also themselves bring about brain fog. And um, so many treatments for autoimmune diseases, many treatments for pain conditions, depression, anxiety, um, they bring about brain fog. Any, basically, any medication that acts on the central nervous system has the capacity to interfere with your cognitive functioning and bring about brain fog. So blood pressure med medications, but even over the counter painkillers, antihistamines, anti-nausea tablets, they can bring about brain fog. Um, of course, any medication that you have been prescribed um, by a doctor or a consultant, don't stop taking it. But if you do suspect that it may be adding to your brain fog, have a conversation with your prescribing doctor because there may be an alternative medication that won't bring about your brain fog. And often it comes down to that conversation about which is worse. I have to do that sometimes with my medications, you know, which is worse, the thing that it's treating or the brain fog. And sometimes it's about lower. I had to do it recently with a, I also have migraine um, and I had to do it recently reducing a dose because I couldn't cope with the, the brain fog and the fatigue. And then of course, if any of you have had COVID, I don't know if you've experienced it, but each time I've had COVID, it has attacked my weak spots. So the first time in October, it's made my migraine absolutely um, horrific. I believe I had COVID again about in June, although I was testing negative, but anyway, um, but I think it's really um, brought up my uh, Sjogren symptoms again. Uh, you know, the dry mouth is, is just, um, uh, and the coughing, uh, you know, has gone way back. Um, but anyway, yeah, taking medications, you know, things have that, that were settled. And I think a lot of people are finding that things that maybe were settled and under control, COVID has changed things around. And, and but basically, I think there can be a balancing act between coping with brain fog and coping with other uh, symptoms. Chemotherapy is, is long known for impairing, you know, uh, bringing around uh, brain fog and that's, you know, chemo, chemo fog. Um, but um, yes, and never stop taking any medication abrupt, abruptly. Um, and again, you were talking there earlier, um, you know, that um, a lot of people associate um, Sjogren's with menopause. And I often wonder, and this is just me wondering whether it's because people, uh, you know, women eventually go to doctors with menopausal symptoms and then symptoms that they've had for a lot longer, which were originally Sjogren's, are then, you know, noticed. Certainly me, I had my first symptoms that sprung me to a doctor in my 30s, but I didn't get my diagnosis till about 12 years later. Um, but um, I just often wonder is that, you know, when dryness kind of um, extends to other areas, whether that's then when people take action rather than not. Because I think as women, we often put up with a lot um, before we before we take action, even though men are supposed to be the ones who kind of, <clears throat> excuse my voice, who kind of uh, are supposed to do that, I wonder. Anyway, um, and this is where I say, um, it's it really rarely is ever sort of one thing when it comes to brain fog. Given that, hormonal fluctuations, the natural ones, as well as hormonal imbalance are associated with brain fog. And given that Sjogren's affects mainly women, um, and given that brain fog affects mainly women, you know, your hormones are going to play a role in your brain fog. So if you've been pregnant, um, for me, in hindsight, I now know that, um, you know, my PMT, you know, and you know, that affected, you know, my brain fog. And in fact, actually, in hindsight, I now know that the clumsiness I experienced, I used to get clump was brain fog, but that would sit, that would herald that and a horrific migraine, which I didn't know then, and I know now, heralded the onset of my period. I would bump into things and drop things, and I would also get a terrible headache, and that heralded my period. Um, and a lot of people um, may experience, you know, feel a bit 
stupid, which is brain fog, uh, pregnancy brain, baby brain, and um, the menopause. And actually, that was one of the, the real drivers for me writing the book was I felt that there was an awful lot of women in perimenopause and menopause who were maybe looking after aging parents who had a diagnosis of dementia, who were experiencing brain fog, who were catastrophizing that they themselves were in a early stages of dementia. And that's something I want to make clear is that dementia is a degenerative disease um, and brain fog is not. Brain fog is reversible. It's something that we can do something about. There are two very, very distinct things. Um, brain fog is brought about as a consequence of various other factors. Many, many of them we can do something about. Um, and it's not a disease in, in, in and of itself. Um, and so that is a positive. Um, uh, the thing just to, to link the hormones, people often think, how come my hormones affect my brain? But you have, your brain can communicates um, through electrical and chemical signals. And you've probably heard of neurotransmitters, but uh, in your brain, such as serotonin and dopamine and all those. But the thing is, hormones, your brain uses hormones to communicate. Now, we tend to think of estrogen and progesterone as, as um, uh, sex hormones, because that's what they're mostly involved in. But you have estrogen um, receptors in your brain. So when estrogen is released, it is the receptors um, in, uh, you know, uh, in parts of your brain, is, for example, is associated in with learning, memory, and in the thinking part of your brain, they're also involved. So if there's drops and changes in estrogen, your thinking, your learning, and your memory are also going to be affected as well as things associated with reproduction. And then progesterone changes will indirectly affect your cognitive functioning because they'll disrupt sleep, you know, through, uh, you know, through the nighttime, through your, your hot sweats, et cetera. So, um, but it's not just your reproductive hormones, obviously, you know, people with hyper or hypothyroidism commonly have brain fog. So do people with type two diabetes um, and other chronic conditions related. The dietary issues, um, a deficiency in vitamin B12, an iron deficiency, a poor diet, um, they can all bring around brain fog, any sort of disruption to your sleep, which is probably why now, if any of you are feeling that your brain is a bit foggy or you're performing a bit under par, it's probably because you're experiencing disrupted sleep at the moment. I know actually I'm a bit more irritable um, than I am, that I would normally be. Someone did something yesterday and I actually kind of lost it a bit when ordinarily I would have just said, sure, that's okay. And I would have hung up the phone and I said, I would have said the feckers, you know, why did they do that? But I actually more or less sort of said it to them. And I know that's because I was sleep deprived, you know, and that happens to anybody, you know, um, and that's because we're kind of, you know, with the heat. So um, basically when you sleep at night, um, your memories are consolidated. They're linked with other memories. That's where you get insight ideas and um, can solve problems, etc. So sleep is critical to cognitive functioning. Poorly managed chronic stress actually um, shrinks parts of your brain associated with um, memory and learning and also so part of your thinking brain, the executive function, and essentially what it does is it suppresses neuroplasticity, which is um, critical to a healthy brain. Uh, your brain needs physical exercise and it also needs mental stimulation. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that now, though, like when I come to the tips. I'm just conscious of my time. I very quickly, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about your brain. It helps to understand how your brain works. Um, essentially, from an evolutionary perspective, you have three brains in that they evolved um, uh, over time. The blue part evolved first, and um, that is your brain stem, and sometimes referred to as the reptilian brain. The three brains are obviously integrated and they speak to each other. But the blue part of the brain is, is responsible for keeping you alive. It does all the things that you don't have to think about, like breathing, uh, controlling your heart rate, your blood pressure and digestion. It is an unconscious part of your brain. And you'll know from watching Eeyore and any of those things that if you have damage to that part of the brain, unless you have access to a... Um, now, there's my brain fog. To a life support machine. Um, you are basically screwed um, because 
you know, um, you will die uh, without it. The pink part of your brain, you'd have to turn your brain upside down really to see it. Um, it's called the limbic system or, and it really other people, you know, can be referred to as the emotional brain. It's involved in things like your emotions, your stress response, fear, learning and memory. The hippocampus is that part of the brain that's involved, involved in learning and memory and our biases. And again, that is an unconscious part of the brain. The stuff that happens there is not conscious to us and then the green part of the brain the crinkly part that we tend to think about when we think about the brain that's where all the parts it evolved last and that's the parts of the brain that really kind of make us more human and, and kind of give us the superiority in the animal kingdom although it also gives us the, the parts of the brain that are allowing us to destroy the planet for ourselves. So that's involved in thinking, language, decision making, planning, and um, complex activities. So the primary purpose of your brain is to keep you alive, right? So if resources are limited, and if you are, if your brain is struggling because it hasn't got enough sleep or because it's been invaded by an infection or if it's trying to fight an infection or if it believes it's fighting an infection with an autoimmune disease and it has limited resources, um, what is going to suffer most is the things that are least essential for survival. So thinking, language, decision-making, planning, the complex actions. Your brain will be focusing on breathing and maintaining uh, those bodily functions and also things like the fear response and those kind of things. So that's sort of a resource element that can be at play. When you think of your brain, you're probably thinking of something like this. I just want you to start thinking, and this is why a lot of people forget about their brain as an organ, you know, they just see it as just this thing that sits there, but your brain is really vibrant, it's dynamic, and it needs you to care for it. It depends on you to care for it. You've got 86 billion brain cells, and these are brain cells here. I think they're very beautiful. These are actually brain cells from a, um, a, a rodent's brain. And I think they look like balloons upside down, and they're just colored from a protein dyeing technique. And uh, the balloon part is the brain cell and then you've got the, the like the string coming out of it are uh, the connections through which your brains communicate with each other and you've got trillions of those and that's how the brain cells communicate with each other and the cells in the rest of your body and it's just so beautiful if you google brain bow you'll find more of those images and it's a great way to think about your brain that you need to be feeding these brain cells and looking after these brain cells and that's just another way to look at your brain uh, communicating so basically your brain is constantly changing and what you do your behaviors your lifestyle your experiences affect how well it functions and how resilient it can be in the face of you know injury, a disease, something like Sjogren's, you know, whatever challenge you're faced with, whatever you're doing in your life will impact on how resilient you can be. And the more resilient your brain is, the less brain fog you will have. That's the kind of positive aspect of it. Now, in my book, I detail loads and loads of these strategies that are particularly linked to specific uh, you know, um, uh, specific brain fog features that you might have. But these are just some very general ones um, because I have specific ones linked to when your executive function is impacted, when your attention is impacted, your processing speed, etc. But what I'm just going to tell you is some very basic ones that will help you overall. Avoid multitasking. It is a complete and utter myth. Your brain cannot, nobody's brain, whether you're female or not, nobody's brain can multitask. Your brain evolved to monotask. When you think you're multitasking, your brain is asked actually task switching at millisecond intervals. And that comes at a cost. And that cost is errors and speed. So when you multitask, you make more errors and it takes longer than if you were to do things in sequence. So don't multitask. Um, routine, your brain absolutely loves routine. That green part of your brain uses more resources, more energy than any other part of your brain. There's a little part of your brain called the basal ganglia in the pink part of your brain, the unthinking part of the brain that can handle routines. 
using far less energy than the green part of your brain. So the green part of your brain constantly scans your behaviors for routines, things that you do at the same time in the same order every day. So the more of your behaviors that you can put into routine that your green part of the brain can identify and give to the basal ganglia and the pink part of your brain, the more energy you can conserve for the complex activities that you may be struggling with um, when you have brain fog. So set up as many routines that your brain can automate as possible. We always talk about living too much of our life on autopilot, but when you've got brain fog, put as much of you can of the mundane things on regular routine and it frees up resources in your brain for autopilot. Remove distractions from around you. Your brain has to process so much information. If you've got brain fog and if there's a lot of distractions around you, you're adding to the workload of your brain. So clear clutter away from you and um, outsource your memory. I do it all the time. We have all these design devices, use them to outsource your memory. As soon as I have a meeting or anything, it goes into my device with proper um, reminders. So I don't have to hold it in here. I keep an easy stash, okay? I get brain for, because I have migraine, because I have um, Sjogren's, you know, and a few other things going on. I do get brain fog quite a bit um, and it terrifies me sometimes because I do a lot of media and I do a lot of talks and sometimes I go, oh my God, I hope it doesn't hit me terribly. Um, and usually I, you know, I'm, I, I manage okay, but when I'm actually working and I, I have another book coming up now that I have to start to write. Um, but what I do is I keep an easy stash. So all of us have some things that really are monotonous, mundane. They don't require a lot of brain power. So what I do is I keep them as a stash so that when I, I hate not to be productive, I hate that my brain fog might stop me doing things that makes me mad, angry and, you know, feeds into depression. So if I keep a stash of things that are easy to do that I can do when I have brain fog, I then avoid all that negative stuff. And I can do that stuff and I can feel I'm productive even when I have brain fog. Um, declutter your laptop, your surroundings, et cetera, for pretty much the same reason you want to, um, you know, get rid of stuff around. Clutter, it, it makes things hard for your brain. Seek support and learn to listen to your body. Um, you know, learn when to persist, persist and when to resist. Sometimes you just have to go, no, brain fog is too bad and I need to sleep. And I do that too. You know, sometimes I literally have to say, no, I can't do anymore. I'm the buster boom person, like I'm sure a lot of you are. A lot of people with autoimmune diseases, you know, my husband says it to me all the time. Sabina, you're doing too much. You're doing too much. You know, you'll just boom then, you know, and I do do that. And, and sometimes it happens. And I do, I just go to bed for a few days. Um, and sometimes it just works for me to do that. Um, and and you balance. But I must say, when it comes to the physical part of it, and I'm going to talk about physical exercise, I'll wait till I talk about the physical exercise, actually, um, to say that, because I do. Yeah, understand. I might just pop in there. Would that be okay? Yeah. Because I, I think that question is actually going to come up based on the chat. So um, just so, because I, I have questions I'd love to ask you. Um, yeah. So if that's okay, um, just for a little bit to, to time. So um, I'm sure someone's going to ask about the exercise, but just, just I suppose to start with, and you touched on this really well, I just wondered if there was anything you wanted to add. And we had a query around whether there might be an underlying common factor for all the conditions where brain fog is experienced. Um, and you mentioned inflammation and um, endocrine stuff. Um, so, you know, hormonal things. It, would you say that's the best explanation um, for, or best potential explanation for now uh, in terms of why it, it might affect people? I think that might be one of the sort of more, you know, well, I see, I think they're all physiological. To be honest, I think that might be where, you know, medics will look. To be honest, I think I think the consequences of some of those. So I think what I'm going to touch on next is probably the more common underlying factors. And I think that's disrupted sleep. Um, do you know what I mean? I think they're almost the consequences of having an underlying condition that um, so the disrupted sleep, 
Um, you know, so say for me with Sjogren's coughing, coughing, coughing all night, what, whatever it may be, it could be pain in other people. Um, disrupted sleep, uh, chronic stress, whether it's, you know, the stress of having an ongoing condition or the stress of not being diagnosed or, or, or whatever associated with it. Um, physical inactivity, not being able to exercise. Um, uh, if you have brain fog, not being cognitively stimulated, it's like a vicious cycle. Um, and um, um, perhaps um, poor diet as a consequence of some of those factors because they're interlinked so if you're chronically stressed you're not going to sleep properly if you're not sleep pro sleeping properly you're going to eat more calories the next day and you're going to require those calories you're going to crave those calories from fatty foods and from sugary foods and so do you know what i mean all those so to be honest my feeling and that's where i go from in the book is if you if you focus on these lifestyle factors your symptoms of brain fog that are associated with your underlying condition are going to be so minimized that you, they may not even be impactful in a way because what you're doing by addressing those is you're also boosting um you're boosting your brain health and we know that if you boost your brain health in the context which is what my first book was about in the context of you know, neurodegenerative diseases like dementia, you can actually build resilience. You can actually build um, literally more brain cells, a healthier brain that can actually compensate for pathology in your brain. Davina, could I interrupt my, my, yeah. my apologies to both you and Michelle, but we're just keen to hear from the rest of the participants. Sure. And there is just 10 minutes left before break. Okay. And we do, we, people do need their break. So just to invite people to put their hand up either physically or to use uh, the- oh, no. While people are doing that, I just want to share with Sabina, there's great comments around, you know, the, the talk's been excellent and really helped people feel validated in their symptoms. So thank you so much uh, for that while people are raising their hands. So let's see um, who, who would like to ask a question or offer a comment in response to Sabina's uh, talk. And Kennedy would like to come in there, Lorna. Fantastic. Could you unmute her, Martha, please? Thank you. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. I found that fascinating from one point of view, mostly, with chronic stress uh, and what it could do to your brain and how it can sort of shrink a bit of your brain. It was very interesting when I went to America to find out what my, my, my complex disease is, which is neuromuscular disease, that I had slight atrophy in the frontal lobe. Okay. Now they make a big deal of that in Ireland, but he said, and he was a, he was also a psychiatrist and he was a neurologist in charge of this case. He said, actually, you'd be surprised how well the brain can compensate, and it is actually so little you wouldn't worry about it. What I do worry about is not understanding the relevance of, say, atrophy in a major disease. Atrophy from contributory factors and uh, the impact, uh, as doctors might see it as all or nothing. Whereas if you go to an expert and you sit and say what you've been through from maybe that high and you have this, he said, don't worry about it. It makes no difference. The brain can compensate. It's not going to get involved in anything else. You haven't got what, you know, what, you may think you have, and that was 2019. But the uncomfortable thing about it is, Irish consultants have a whole different view, which can impact on care. And it is worrying to see an all or nothing approach when we know by looking at psychology, lived experience of chronic disease or even one of the two diseases childhood experience can impact and if if I wanted anything from diseases like Shogun and understanding it to get the awareness out of there that if you say something about a person without having 
full qualification to say something because you see a little bit of this and a little bit of that, so you must have this. I'm firmly convinced that education at base is important for our consultants who are dealing especially with women. And I'm strong on that because I see it happening. I get PMs all the time from people with related Shogun diseases and Shogun and lupus, how they're cared for, how they're spoken to, because there isn't the understanding. And when you mention psychology, brain health, brain fog, it makes perfect sense. And it makes perfect sense for patients. But does it make sense for the people who are going to impact on your care in the future? That's who it needs to make sense for, if they're willing to listen, of course. Thank you, Anne. And let's just hand over to Sabina to respond there. And there's five minutes left for another question if someone else wants to raise their hand. Sabina, you have another question from Sian Roberts there. Hi, Sian. Yeah. Hi, my name's Sean. Sean. It's a Welsh one on the other side of the, you know, UK. Um, so just to say, I really enjoyed what you had to say. Um, I thought a lot of my brain fog had kind of um, got a lot less I, after starting hydroxychloroquine, my pain and so, so I felt so much better. But when you were talking, it really resonated with me because there was still stuff that I still have. So I'm looking forward to getting your book and being able to, um, you know, to find out more about that. Um, it was interesting what the last lady said about um, trying to get the teaching out there. Um, and my, my other job, my real job is I'm a research nurse as well. And it takes so long to get research from research to practice. Um, so any way that we can sort of help with that is um, is the way forward, I think, or one yeah. of the ways forward. But it is really difficult because they don't always recognise what is um, going on. So I had a lung appointment because I was diagnosed with bronchiectasis a couple of years ago. And I believe that that can be a part of the Sjogren's as well. Um, and I was told by my respiratory consultant that maybe I should read less. Um, and uh, and then he then he discharged me. So when I go back to my rheumatologist, I'm going to ask him for a suggestion of somebody that might be able to listen to that. So it's not really a question, but it's a thank you so much for because I could have just ticked everything off that you were saying. So it was just thank you so much from my heart. Oh, thank you. Thank you. No, I think it's really important. And, and one of the reasons I wrote the book is so that you can actually go and educate some of the doctors. And um, because in the book, I have that sort of tick box. I, you know, you can get the book in the library. I'm not here to sell the book, if you, if you know what I mean. It's available free in libraries, you know, because look, I used to work in research. Um, PPI is so important. Um, I used to work in research and, and, and basically I came to university late in life and, and was just shocked and horrified to find there was so much academic research out there with important information for patients that, that had been published years ago that wasn't shared with the public, that never got to the public, that never got to GPs. And so really I don't work in research anymore. I translate research into easy to understand information. That's why I've written my books. And, and basically this brain fog book is to say, look, here's what your symptom is. Here's where it relates to in your brain. And, and you can go to your GP and say, look, this is the bit that's not working, but actually here's the tip. But I do want to very briefly, I by three minutes left, just to say to you guys, um, sleep, stress, exercise, and nutrition. If you work on those four, it will minimize your brain fog, right? Um, it's absolutely critical for your brain function, but it also will help eliminate toxins in your brain. Schedule, regular schedule, um, exposure to light. You've got to start dimming your lights in the evening, get out in daylight for at least an hour during the day. Your brain evolved in natural daylight. Electric light confuses it. OK, that's um, important. Um, just really quickly on the next one. Physical exercise. I have to talk about this with children. When I was really, really bad, 
I could not walk. I love my dogs. I really stopped being able to use anything. I couldn't even stir the dinner. The pain I had in my body was excruciating. I went from being a gym bunny to being unable to move. When I eventually got my rheumatologist, he said, Sabina, I'm really going to cry here because it really is unbelievable. And um, he said to me, Sabina, you have to move. And I couldn't, I would cry trying to move. And I literally went from walking 10 steps to back moving. If and when I get bad again, I have to remember that. 10 steps or two steps or whatever. You can work from that to getting again, it's pain. The way I work at it is, it's, it, you know, it's if you break an ankle, there comes a point where you have to rest it for a while, but there comes a point that if you don't put your foot down and start to use it again, you will lose the capacity to ever use it again. But there is a point where it's painful, but you have to kind of work through it. And the thing is, aside from the use of your physical body, your brain needs a physical exercise to get the nutrients, but it also needs it to promote neuroplasticity. When you exercise, a chemical called BNDF is re released in your brain. It's like miracle growth for your brain, and it encourages the growth of new brain cells. And Kennedy, that will help beat that atrophy in your brain. It will help grow new brain cells. And that's why physical exercise is so important. Similarly, managing stress is critical. And the best way you can manage stress is to have fun. Laughter is the natural, nature's natural stress buster. It actually lowers cortisol levels. So make a point every day of doing something that's fun, that makes you laugh. Because often when we have a chronic disease, we forget to do that. We forget to have fun. And the best diet for your brain is a Mediterranean diet. And it is so simple. Lots of colorful fruit, vegetables, oily fish, get your um, oil from olive oil, nuts, etc. That's it. If you, if you follow those, that will boost your brain health. And Anne, everybody's brain is atrophying from the age of 30. <laughs> everybody's brain is shrinking. Sabina, those things. Sabina yeah, thank you. Shut up now. <laughs> no, no, that's absolutely wonderful. And I'm just conscious of letting people know that we are beginning our 10 minute break now. So please do take your break and fuel your brain with nutrition. But just before, um, if anybody wants to stay on to ask Sabina a question, yeah, please feel free to do so. Sharon, you had your hand up there. Yeah, no, I, it's just been absolutely brilliant. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Just listening to this, I've had showruns probably for about 15 years at this point. I was diagnosed in my um, early 30s and I'm a lecturer and a researcher. And what I have noticed in the last couple of years is that sometimes I'm having these sort of very difficult to pull words and to describe things. And it just comes out of nowhere. And I never put it down to showgrin syndrome. And so this has sort of opened up my mind to, I guess I was so focused always on the dryness, the fatigue, the joint pain never really thought about like what exactly is brain fog etc so I think and I'm, I'm, I presume there's other people here listening as well who this is triggering for them okay actually I, this is another aspect as well so um, I'm looking forward to reading all these things and figuring out how to cope with it <laughs> so, yeah. so thanks. And I think we adapt do you, do, you, do you know what I mean I think Sheen when she was talking she was Shan if I, if I pronounced it right and um, that we adapt because I was even listening earlier today and, and when people were talking about symptoms and I was kind of going, oh, God, yeah, that's my showgrounds. But like I've just, you know, I got my diagnosis so long ago that you kind of just you, you kind of just you get used. That's yeah. what the human brain is adaptable. We're adaptable. You and learn to live you with it. You accept these things and you forget maybe that they're part of the condition that you have. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you again so much. Perfect. So it is my pleasure to introduce our second invited guest speaker, um, Dr. Eleanor O'Sullivan. And as mentioned earlier, backed by popular demand, Dr. Eleanor O'Sullivan has worked as a dental surgeon for 40 years, initially in private practice. But in addition, she has worked in the HSC for the past 30 years in the Cork University Dental Hospital and School as a senior lecturer in oral surgery. Dr. Eleanor O'Sullivan retired from clinical practice due to arthritis just two weeks ago. 
but she is still incredibly active in research and education. In addition to her role as the chair of the Head and Neck Cancer Publication Involvement Committee and Network, Elner's main clinical focus has been dental, oncon bleh, dental oncology, which is the care of patients, many of whom suffer from severe dry mouth. So I'll hand over to um, Elner. I spoke last year about the etiology and about, I suppose, a lot of the scientific aspects of oral issues for those who suffer from Sjogren's. So uh, this talk was going to be extremely practical and I hope you'll find it useful. Um, so looking at the criteria and I suppose building on a lot of the conversation and it has been a fascinating conversation. I'm so interested in the conversations I could listen to the speakers that have been on already for the rest of the afternoon. Um, but again, a lot of people struggle with the diagnosis and these are the official criteria in relation to having a diagnosis of Sjogren's, but it isn't essential to have all of them. Um, it isn't, I suppose, one of the most standard ways of, of getting an official diagnosis would be either having blood tests and or having a labelled gland biopsy, which is usually a very minor little operation. It would normally be done by oral medicine specialist or by an, an oral surgery specialist. Um, it just makes a, a small little incision into your lower lip and they just kind of stick in the tweezers and nip out a couple of the small, extremely tiny slivery glands that look like little seeds or grains and you shouldn't really have any long-term issues after that. However, um, anybody who has persistent dry mouth, I think ought to consider themselves as somebody who has dry mouth. And in relation to WHO, in fact, the official definition from WHO is if the person, if you, or the patient thinks they have a dry mouth, then they have a dry mouth. And then it's split into objective um, and subjective. Objective is where you have a reduction in the output of saliva and subjective is where you have a normal salivary output, but the person isn't, isn't feeling lubricated. And that's usually psychological. Normally uh, in relation to the patients that I would see objective, uh, objective xerostomia or extreme extremely dry mouth um, is is very easy to diagnose um, you you may experience any or all of these issues here okay it is however important also I think to remember that even if you have a diagnosis of having Sjogren's that the whole area of actually having a dry mouth is actually is actually multifactorial um, it can be associated with a lot of different drugs um, I also want to say um, it's starting to sound a little bit like a Me Too conference, but I actually have Sjogren's myself. So I speak from somebody who treats people who have it. Um, and I also speak from somebody who actually has experienced it. And again, as I noticed in the chat, a lot of people were diagnosed when they themselves said, I think this could be Sjogren's because I have dry eyes, dry mouth, etc. Do you think it could be? And I was told, yeah, I suppose it could. So a lot of the drugs that you and I are taking because of arthritis, because of all the issues that all of us experience, um, a lot of those have a side effect of actually also causing dry mouth. And then you have to get the balance right. Um, it, it's worth discussing these uh, with the person who's prescribed them for you. And also, if you have a good GP, it's a great asset to see, is there an alternative uh, that doesn't have the same issue in relation to causing dry mouth? Um, it's really important to stay hydrated and all of my patients, I always recommend that they would carry a small bottle of water with them at all times. Um, issues in relation to mouth breathing. Um, this is something as well that's important. Um, there's a very good, uh, well, there's a very interesting book, which is called Shut Your Mouth and Breathe. And it's, it's useful. It, it's actually written by a guy in Hungary who claims that by breathing through our nose rather than our mouth, we can make our lives a heck of a lot better and it's something to bear in mind that um, it, it can be a habit and it is worth checking to see if your lips are actually closed when the mouth is not in use because having the mouth hanging open it causes air drying and this makes the mouth drying an awful lot um, a, a lot more severe obviously if somebody is ill for any other illness or any other issue it also increases the level of dehydration and your interest in staying um, adequate adequately nourished and adequately hydrated. Um, in relation to diseases, again, just because we have Sjogren's doesn't mean we can't also have the joy of having other diseases. And each one of 
like issues in relation to sarcoidosis or diabetes or arthritis are also associated with issues in relation to dry mouth for various different reasons. At the moment, I think all of us are experiencing um, extreme heat. And um, if, if, you, if you live and you work in an area where you're using fans, again, it's, it, it's nice to keep you cool. But again, it's actually making the air a lot more dry. One thing that's useful is to put a small little dish of water onto um, an area where it won't get knocked. And this helps to hydrate the air. Um, stress, anxiety, depression, all those things um, in themselves actually reduce this library output. And also, um, if you're taking medication for them, it also has the side effect of often causing the mouth to be very dry. So what are the clinical signs? We have signs and symptoms. So again, if you're speaking or if you're just sitting there and you're not actually swallowing in, in roughly one minute, you should have a nice little swimming pool of saliva under your tongue. For those of us that have dry mouth, that doesn't happen. And this is the lack of pooling. Often we may produce saliva, but it's not the nice... Uh, uh, light lubricating oil, it, it can be a sticky, viscous, frothy saliva that's not as good. Um, we get accumulation of plaque, and this is because we're missing all of the really good functions of saliva, which I'll speak about a little bit. Um, the skin of the mouth, which is the mucosa, can be red, inflamed, can be sticky to touch, and um, you can have a lobulated and very bald and sticky tongue, which is on the screen there. Um, you also often get these kind of fissures in and out of it, and it, it, it can be very sensitive and very sensitive to spicy foods, etc. Uh, some patients who have Sjogren's will also have swelling of the salivary glands, particularly the ones up here near your ears, which are the parotids, and a small number of patients go on to get a specific type of cancer, which is NHL, which is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. A lot of people who have dry mouth will actually experience um, a very unpleasant side effect, which is getting candida infections, which is thrush. And um, going back to the 17th century, this was diagnosed by a Frenchman as being the disease of the diseased. Normal, healthy people with normally healthy mouths don't actually get thrush. So it, again, it's both a sign. It's, it's a warning sign for whoever is treating you that if somebody is getting thrush and they're not after finishing a couple of courses of antibiotics for a chest infection or something, then this is a reason for them to ask. The most important question is, why are you getting this? It's also a symptom um, and um, it can have a huge impact on the person's quality of life. So again, the issues that patients complain about would be dry mucosa, uncomfortable, sore, irritated mucosa. Some people complain of a burning mouth, a stinging, irritated sensation. Um, also having mouth ulcers frequently, um, not being able to eat foods that are dry, which is known as the cracker sign. Um, issues in relation to swallowing, in relation, in relation to taste, in relation to speech infections, as I mentioned, increased risk of dental disease. And this can be both decay and, and also issues in relation to gums. Um, issues in relation to retention of your dentures, having difficulty keeping them in. When you speak, um, often people will say that, they, that they're actually kind of clicking and clacking. And some people complain of having halitosis, which is bad breath. So in relation to rampant decay, this is because of the lack of saliva. And again, if you eat something, it puts, um, it, it makes the oral cavity become actually quite acidic. Um, and we need to have our natural saliva in order to balance this acidity. And this is called buffering because if the mouth stays acidy for too long, it softens the enamel and this opens the pathway for uh, all these bacteria to, uh, to start causing decay. One of the biggest problems and one of the main reasons why people who have a dry mouth will often look as if they don't, as if they haven't really spent enough time at, actually washing and brushing their teeth. This is because for the average person, it's easy to get the plaque off. For somebody who has a dry mouth, it is irritatingly sticky and it sticks around the necks of the teeth particularly. So you can see this person here, they have shiny, really extreme, extremely clean, um, almost polished actual crowns up to here and down to here, but it's actually the neck of the tooth where the, the sticky plaque will stay because you haven't got the, the water from the saliva to flush it away. So if a normal person eats a cornflake and leaves it in the mouth, it will flush away. If somebody who has dry mouth eats something like a cornflake, it can stay there for hours because it won't be flushed away. 
you also get changes to the consistency and the, the actual makeup of your saliva and makes it not as useful, not as good at protecting you from infections. And, um, and again, sticking with the areas that decay, it's particularly the tips, the teeth, which is a very unusual place to get decay and the necks of the teeth. Um, and even on, on what we call the cusps, which is the points of the teeth and your teeth can get extremely brittle and extractions can be quite difficult. And in some cases you can find that after a year or two, several of the teeth have just literally snapped off. And again, this is another example here. The average dentist looking in will say, you're not brushing your teeth, but actually looking at this, this is polished into a gloss. It's just up here at the areas where the tooth enters into the gum is where the plaque sticks. And I often have my patients brushing eight times a day and still the, they won't get up to having 100% oral hygiene. Going back to the official um, stated, I suppose, wisdom. Um, the importance is that all patients with Sjogren's ought to be treated by people who have expertise and also to have a multidisciplinary team looking after them. It's very important to have a baseline evaluation and make notes of how things are at the beginning. And also you should consider topical therapy and systemic therapy. So I'm going to leave all that to the side. The other um, instruction is that somebody who has mild dry mouth ought to just have stimulation, um, e either using items such as, uh, for example, chewing gum, which is non-pharmacological, not a drug. Somebody who is moderate, you can use drug stimulation, and those that have severe, you would give them salivary replacement therapy. I actually disagree with this, and I don't see any point that anybody should wait until they have nasty, extreme, extremely severe xerostomia. Um, until they start all the aids that are available. So on to some suggestions in relation to management. Number one is educate yourself and educate the people who are looking after you. It's really important that you inform whoever is treating you that you have a dry mouth, you speak up about your symptoms. I think a lot of us are very accepting. Um, if you've had chronic illness, you, you become almost, I, I think, impervious after a while you ignore your pain in order to get through your day, you ignore your dry mouth, you ignore the eyes being gritty and watery, etc. because it's now your new normal. So you can forget to speak up about these things. Um, stay hydrated, ways to stay hydrated would be, it's important that we drink adequate water. I prefer still water, stay away from anything that has bubbles in it because the bubbles are made by it actually having an acid pass through it. So again, anything that's acidic is gonna soften the enamel of your teeth and make them weak. Some people find using a small room um, spray humidifier is useful. And as I mentioned, looking to see whether your mouth is hanging open or whether your lips are actually sealed is very useful. And it actually keeps the oral cavity um, a lot more hydrated. Smoking is a no-no. Obviously, putting hot smoke and vaping also really significantly increases the temperature in the mouth, heats up the mouth and makes it really, really dry and cracked. And really, anybody who's using those devices, I would start there by stopping those. Excessive alcohol. Again, if you use an alcohol wipe and we've all been spraying everything that moves and doesn't move for the past two years with alcohol, you know anything that you put alcohol on, alcohol on it evaporates. So using Alcohol, obviously, I like a glass of wine, but you shouldn't do it to excess. If you have alcohol, you are going to have increased dry mouth. If you use mouthwashes that contain alcohol, these are going to make the mouth drier. Look at the food that you're eating. Yes, I love eating crackers and stuff like that, but I can't eat them anymore. So you stay away from things that are excessively dry. And it's important not to focus on what you can't eat, but to focus on what you can eat. Like, um, a lovely chocolate eclair who has a nice layer of chocolate on top and a nice layer of cream in the middle, not the most healthy, but, but definitely far easier to eat than eating a dry cracker. Um, in relation to your foods, stews, casseroles, using slow cookers, making your food really moist and very tasty is an excellent um, option. Um, excessive caffeine also makes you drier. Okay, so I I now have switched over to mainly drinking decaf, and I'm somebody who spent five years abroad, and I used to bring 
um, almost a suitcase with me that, that contained Barry's tea. I lived on Barry's tea because I'm from Cork. And so I, I now have maybe one or two cups uh, that would be Barry's tea. And the rest of the time I, I, I will stick with um, using decaf. One of the things that I find most helpful is actually using chewing gum as a stimulant. Um, it is a mechanical stimulant. It actually tricks the brain into thinking that, that there is a meal on the way and this sends a signal, I uh, say, up to the brain and over the salivary glands and it gets whatever glands are still functioning. Um, it gets them stimulated into actually producing as much saliva as they are able to do. You can use other options and one of them has been mentioned already in the chat, which is using pilocarpine. Um, it is excellent. It doesn't suit everybody. Um, it is actually more useful for those that have issues in relation to dry mouth because of Sjogren's rather than other causes, for example, radiotherapy. Um, it is a good stimulant. However, it, it can cause excess motility inside in the gut. It, it can make people have diarrhea. It can make people's noses run. It can make people's eyes water. So it's definitely worth speaking about it, asking about it, giving it a go. If it suits you, it's excellent. If it doesn't suit you, then it's not for you. Uh, the next thing is a slightly alternative. Um, some research has been done using electrical stimulation, which is using a TENS machine. I haven't found it useful. It can stimulate the eighth cranial nerve. Um, it's, it, it's very experimental. Acupuncture I've used an awful lot in relation to my head and neck cancer patients who have radiotherapy induced damage. And for them, strangely, it has been very successful, which doesn't make any logical sense to me because when you get a ray gun and you actually literally blast a person's radiotherapy, um, areas that are able to produce saliva, you would think the damage would be a lot more um, long lasting and an awful lot more severe than it would be from an autoimmune disease. But my experience is that anybody who has had Sjogren's that I've actually referred for acupuncture, it hasn't worked. The next thing then is looking at ways so you can hydrate yourself, you can look at your behavior to stop you actually from making yourself excessively dehydrated. You can look at ways to stimulate the saliva and you can look at ways in which you can replace the saliva. Um, and I'll speak more about that again in a second. So the other thing then is in relation to oral hygiene. A lot of people with Sjogren's, uh, especially those who have secondary Sjogren's will have arthritis and this can affect the hands. So I'm not a huge fan of electric toothbrushes. Um, they are in fashion at the moment. Um, I've act I actually gave somebody in my own family one and uh, his plaque score actually went up instead of going down. I tend to use a manual brush myself. Um, I think you have much more, you have better control. It doesn't spin around and injure the gums. But again, it doesn't matter what you use as long as, as it really does the job. Um, either the electric or the manual should always have a soft head in it. It's important to floss because if you don't floss the areas between the teeth, um, you're only washing 60% of your teeth. If you have arthritis, there's lots of different ways of modifying the handle of the brush and you can use a floss. And this, if you have difficulty using floss, this is actually a water flosser, also called a water jet or a water pick. And it just literally squirts a small squirt of water in and out of the teeth and helps to cleanse the areas between. These are small, uh, uh, um, extremely useful brushes, which are called TP brushes excellent again for getting into the spaces between teeth. How to protect your teeth, regular dental attendance. I was very happy to see that over 70% of you actually have been to the dentist in, in the last six months, which is excellent. And it is considerably higher than the Irish population as a whole, I can tell you. And certainly for my head and necks, I used to ask them when was the last time you saw a dentist and a lot of them would be between 20 and 40 years. And so far my record is 76 years since the last dental visit. So, you are really ahead of the posse and looking after yourselves. In relation to your dental team, make sure they know that you, you have issues with dry mouth. And again, explain to them how it is impacting on you and seek their health. Um, I, would, I would advise that you use special toothpaste, a one that does not have SLS in it, which is a foaming agent. You can use the Sensitine, actual specific one here, which is Pro Enamel, or I will give you another range as well. You can use a mouthwash that contains chlorhexidine, something like Kin or something like Corsadel, and this reduces the stickiness of the plaque. And this will help with the buildup and stop 
it from actually being such a big issue. Um, if you use a mouthwash that contains chlorhexidine, it can cause staining. So it's important to accept that there's a bit of a balance there. This is um, a way of having extra calcium and phosphate. This is a way of getting extra protection from having additional fluoride, which is very important. I find this is the easiest way to use it is by having a special toothpaste that you use once or twice a day, but you can get a rinse, you can have a tray with a gel in it and you can have a varnish. Um, <laughs> issues in relation to giving yourself additional saliva, that there's a whole range of products which are saliva replacements, so artificial salivas. That, um, I would find, I would, I would most commonly recommend BioExtra, um, which is inexpensive. Xerostom is also very good biotin. There's one called Mouth Coat, which is a, a lovely spray. You can get pastilles, you can get sprays, you can get gels, you can get toothpaste, and you can get mouth rinses. This is an item called Xyli Melt, which is very useful for those that have very severe dry mouth. It's a little tablet. It, it, it sticks onto the gum on this brownie side and it slowly releases a substance xylitol. Um, I would recommend that you do not spend your day eating sweets, sucking sweets, which an awful lot of people are actually recommended by certain um, members of the medical profession. It only asks for more decay and increases your rate of getting thrush. So um, other ideas here, are all, all have been recommended and found useful by different patients to me. I just want to say a few words about candida because for some patients, this is a huge issue. If you're somebody who gets it occasionally, you can use the lozenges or you can use the gel. If you're somebody who is really plagued by it, I would recommend you get a prescription for a specific drug, which is fluconazole. Some people have to take it for um, over the five days, normally to be five to seven days. If you have a really severe case of it um, and it keeps coming back, I often have to put a specific patients onto it for a long term, maybe for eight or 12 weeks. If you wear a denture, it's important that this is removed and soaked overnight using something like Milton because it disinfects the denture. If you don't do that, then you're just reintroducing the thrush each time. Limit your sugar, natural yogurt is useful and also stop smoking. So in relation to mouth ulcers, um, this is an issue for some patients. Um, and again, you can have mouth ulcers for, for lots of different reasons. It can, it, it can be because of the friction uh, when your skin is dry and it's rubbing off areas of your teeth, which could be rough. You can have a history of having ulcers. One of the easiest ways of treating mouth ulcers, if they're not too severe, is making up a homemade rinse, which is using a litre or, or even one pint of warm water from the kettle, let it cool, add in a spoon of salt, a small teaspoon of salt and a small teaspoon of ordinary bread soda. It's really soothing. Um, and it also helps to reduce you getting secondary infection. Over the counter, you can use rinses, you can use gels, you can use pastes. Uh, over here, I have an X against Bongella, not a fan, it's an acid. Um, and I'm not a fan of using chlorhexidine in, in relation to mouth ulcers. It's excellent for reducing plaque. It's not any good for mouth ulcers. Um, my favorite one would be Kin Care, and I can talk more about that if people wish. Again, if you are really struggling with mouth ulcers, you need to see somebody, you can talk with your dentist and if they are able to cope with it, excellent. If not, ask to see an oral medicine specialist. Steroids are very, very useful and they can be used either as an ointment or a cream or as, as a tablet. Um, normally it would be dissolved and, and you'd hold it up against the, the ulcers. You can also, if you have extremely severe ulcers, you can see an oral, an oral medicine consultant who can um, explore extremely high-tech drugs. Just giving you a three minute heads up there, Eleanor, thank you. That's perfect. I will just talk even faster than we normally do in Cork. Uh, I don't wanna scare anybody by this next slide, but it is important that I flag something for you, that people who have Sjogren's disease actually often have osteoporosis. And also if you're taking drugs in relation to the osteoporosis, you are at increased risk of having what's known as osteonecrosis of the jaw, ONJ are also called fossy jaw. Um, a couple of recent reports were excellent on this and I've included them there. So I've listed some of the drugs, again, Zomita, Fosamax. If you're on these, you will know about it, Prolia, et cetera. It has a significant impact on your quality of life if you get osteonecrosis. So this is really important for people who are taking these drugs to really interact really well with dental team 
to make sure that you avoid infections and that you avoid extractions or any type of trauma from an ill-fitting denture, etc. This is somebody here who has it. They had an extraction here. That they were taking Zometa for osteoid for excuse me for osteoporosis, and they start to have little areas of the bone start to stick out through the gum and start to shed. This is one of the pieces that I removed, and I was able to get that to heal up over eighteen months. But again, it can be very nasty. So I'm I'm not wanting to scare you, but I'm just saying it's really important if you're somebody who has Sjogren's who also has osteoporosis, who's taking these drugs, really important that you let your team know that you don't have extractions, if at all possible, and if it's essential that the person that's doing them is an expert in this area. So the opportunities are making sure that you get the correct diagnosis, that you're seeing the all of the appropriate team, that you look after yourself really, really well, that you go back and think of the five Ds that I mentioned, because small gains add up. Look at your medication. I'm certainly not saying that you should stop any of your existing medication, but a lot of drugs are well known to cause issues in relation to dry mouth, excluding Sjogren's. So it is worth discussing this with your GPC. Is there anything, for example, antihypertension issues in relation to blood pressure, in relation to diabetes, in relation to anxiety, depression, sleep, et cetera. Nearly every second drug inside in the MEMS has a side effect of causing dry mouth. So sometimes these can be swapped around with ones that are less um, inclined to cause this problem. Again, I mentioned some of the drugs. The usual one is actually pilocarpine. Um, so I will just stop there. I think I'm roughly on time. This is just a summary. I. I have skimmed over things. One thing I didn't mention was actually some people complain of having halitosis, which is bad breath. Usually I find most people who have bad breath, it's because of having dental issues. So if you have accumulations of plaque, if you have an excess number of bacteria that are hanging around in the plaque, if you have dental decay, if you have gum disease, these call the plaque. Um, if you have difficulty chewing your food and you're actually swallowing things whole or um, not having a good diet, this is causes excuse me, if I speak too fast, I start to, I start to stumble. Um, if you're having stomach related issues, often the sense of bad breath is coming up from the gut. Um, if you have uh, an issue in relation to bad breath, I would look at the oral hygiene, I would look at the dental issues, I'd look at your diet, and there's also a substance which is called CB12, which is a spray which is quite useful um, if you want to mask it. But I, I don't like people masking issues because sometimes it can be hiding um, a more nasty condition, for example, something like a malignant ulcer. So, you know, I would ask people to always seek help if they have a condition like that. So um, I hope I didn't speak excessively fast. I probably did, and I'm sorry. I hope it was of some use to you, and I'm open for questions on any of the above or anything outside of this. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. And Eleanor, from the chat, I know it was a really well-received uh, presentation. And we've invite again, we've invite anybody to raise their hand if they want to turn on their camera and microphone and ask um, Eleanor a question directly. And Joan, while people are doing that, I might just, just run through a couple of people who have been kind to put their questions in the chat. So um, one recurring query was around the salivary gland um, biopsies and a few things. So what professionals should do it? When's the best timing to do it? Um, is there enough experience in Ireland to read the results? And um, is there any kind of circumstances in terms of gum health when it shouldn't be done, for example, is, if there's inflammation? So sorry, there's a few questions together. But... No, that's <laughs> absolutely perfect. Um, yes, we have lots of expertise in Ireland related to this. Anybody who's a trained um, oral maxillofacial surgeon or anybody who is a uh, a trained oral medicine consultant or any one of their team. Uh, they often have SHOs and registrars, etc. Um, anybody who is seeking this can either go privately to one of the maxillofacial surgeons or to an oral medicine. But I suppose the easiest place would probably be uh, to go to the Cork Dental School and Hospital or, or us uh, to ask to be referred to Dublin Dental School and Hospital. We only have two dental schools. Um, and we don't have anything over in the west of Ireland, unfortunately. But, but as I say, um, the HSE as well, if you can get a referral there to the oral maxillofacial consultant there, they tend to have long waiting lists. Um, in relation to when, as soon as you want your diagnosis released, really, it is one of the best ways of getting a diagnosis. 
um, there's lots of expertise. It, it, it is a minor procedure. It takes the actual procedure. It takes about five minutes. But like everything else, it takes about a half an hour because you have to go and you have to sit down. You've got to get a gun on you. You have to be numbed up. You should not have any any side effects after it, except maybe a small scar on your lip. Um, it's normally done, if I can be rude and show, it's normally done here on the inside of your lip. Uh, because you have literally hundreds of minor salivary glands there and it's easy to access those. It's a small little incision about a centimetre, maybe one and a half centimetres. It should not be two inches. Um, and it, 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 it should not get infected. It should heal up within a couple of days and you should have no problems um, except for being numb for an hour or two. Um, and I, I would recommend it. We have tons of expertise here in relation. Like it's a straightforward, really routine test no problem getting a diagnosis at all from it it's easy peasy and would it be and there's just another specific question around this inflammation of the mucosa would you recommend oh yeah absolutely mm-hmm. issues in relation to the gums and things nothing to do with your lip okay so whether you, you have a dental abscess like obviously if you have a dental abscess you won't be in the form for anybody causing anything else to be sore in the mouth but um it's it, it's something which unless you have a huge amount of ulceration in your mouth, which makes it difficult for you to actually have somebody working in your mouth, as long as your mouth is comfortable, you can have this done at any stage. And it, it is a good way of getting, um, I, I suppose, a kind of a nice definitive scientific diagnosis. There's one question around specifically yep. around pregnancy. So is pilocarpine contraindication in pregnancy? I suppose as a pharmacist, I'm happy to... Uh, you know, say that it's, it's normally not used in pregnancy and um, it's not specifically contraindicated, but it wouldn't be something um, that would ordinarily be used, but you need some specialist advice around that for something like that. I would totally absolutely agree. Again, I always think in relation to pregnancy, the less number of drugs you can take, the better. Secondly, your hormones are all over the place as well, which isn't helping you in relation to dry mouth. Um, also, it can cause nausea, um, it can cause upset tummies, it can cause diarrhea, all, all these things. I, I have to say that I know a lot of people like it. it. It's used an awful lot in the UK. Any of my head and neck patients that I've given it to have said, stop the lights, I'm not taking this. So it's very much a case of if you want to try it, I, I would see somebody and start it, start off low and actually I, I would increase your dose slowly. You can get it off your GP. Um, I would take it as an experiment to see if it suits you. It doesn't suit everybody. If it works for you, super. Um, but if it doesn't, it's not worth suffering, you know? Hope that Thanks answers so much. Okay. Joan, I'll pass to you. Perfect. I'm just going to go to Catherine and then Grania. So Catherine Williams, you had your hand up first. Um, yes, I do. Um, I'm from the USA, so I really want to thank you so much for allowing us to participate, those of us who are. And I also have Irish ancestry, so I absolutely love listening to the Irish brogue that my great-grandparents and grandparents had. So my question is... Um, and I did have to miss some of this because it's seven in the morning and I had to take my dog out. But um, burning mouth and throat, those are issues I've had for quite a while and um, getting no answers really. Um, mine include tongue, palate and lips and I've seen dermatology, ENT, GI and we'll be following up a second round. But any thoughts on that? I do use lidocaine in a Mylanta situation. I also have a taste distortion where everything tastes like salt. So pilocarpine has not worked for me because it only increases the agony that I have. And it truly is a constant agonizing pain. So I'm just wondering if you um, have some thoughts on that um, for parts and treatments. Absolutely. An excellent question. May I ask you, Catherine, have you been diagnosed with Sjogren's? Um, you know, I have. It's kind of interesting. I'm seronegative. My lip biopsy was negative, but I went to Mayo Clinic and with all my other symptoms, he didn't diagnose me as as sicka. He said, you have Sjogren's. They probably read because I'm from a smaller town. He's um, assuming they read the biopsy incorrectly. So he's just, I've just been gone going with a Sjogren's symptoms and Sjogren's diagnosis for many years. Okay. I I would slightly question that um, stepping into murky waters um, <laughs> because um, there is a condition which is burning mouth syndrome, which is extremely well known. Um, and there's an awful lot of, 
of papers written about it and an awful lot of research. You need to see an oral medicine consultant. Um, often it, it, it can be really well actually treated using amitriptyline. Amitriptyline is an old fashioned antidepressant. So um, I'm not necessarily saying that it's an issue of depression. Sometimes it can be, but actually amitriptyline is used an awful lot in relation to pain management, even in relation to cancer pain management, because it, it, it actually alters how our discomfort is perceived in the brain. Um, so I have, I'm not an oral medicine consultant. My expertise is head and neck cancer. So I'm stating that for the record, but I have treated a number of patients who have BMS. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering if your real issue is BMS, you could obviously have Sjogren's as well, but normally you would have some of the specific scientific physical features. Um, and I think perhaps if you don't have Sjogren's, you might, be getting sent down the wrong road in relation to looking for health. Um, so I, I would not recommend polycarpine. I would recommend hydration, but I would seek out an oral medicine consultant and asking for somebody who has expertise in relation to this specific condition, which is BMS, which is burning mouth syndrome. If you look it up online, you'll find a lot. If you want to go onto the Cork Dental Hospital actual website, you'll find a leaflet on it, which is written by the oral medicine consultants there not me, and um, it, it may be a useful starting point for you. Stress management, uh, CBT, and but, but I would find, like I've, I've had patients that I have, I've offered them amitriptyline, they've initially been a little bit reluctant and they have said, this has changed my life, you know. Um, it would be a low dose, um, it won't make you dopey or sleepy or anything else. And it's, it's as I say, it's often used in relation to pain management um, because of how it alters, how issues of discomfort and stinging and pain and even phantom pain and an awful lot of complex issues are perceived in the brain. I hope that's of some help to you. Um, I have tried almost all of the anti-epileptic, um, anti-seizure medications, been followed no, by... No, no, this well, is... Well, none of them have worked. I've tried amitriptyline, I'm trying okay. Keppra now, and the side effects are too much for me to bear. Um, so, you know, I... I yeah. The, the anti-epileptic medication is totally different now, um, because... And again, it can cause nausea and issues, whereas amitriptyline doesn't cause nausea... Um, it, it's only issue would really be uh, a little bit more dry mouth and a little bit of sleepiness in some people. But again, you'd be taking it a very low dose. Um, other than that, I would fall back on all, on all of the very practical mechanical ways of treating it. Um, but and looking at your diet, staying away from spicy food, etc. But I think your oral medicine consultant would definitely be um, your your option to go to seek help. Okay, gonna, thank you. Sorry, could I cross that and say Grania uh, is, has an, her hand raised and has been waiting patiently. Yeah, um, can I ask about um, salivary gland irrigation? Is um, anybody doing it in Ireland? I've um, heard that it's quite widely used in other uh, countries uh, with good effect and that it's been shown to improve salivary output for up to a year. I haven't actually heard of anybody doing it. Um, I, I know nothing about it, being honest with you. Um, I really can't see how it could help because this is not a condition that's caused by a gland that has a blockage in it. Like if you had a stone in the gland or if you had something like you had a mucus plug or something that, that, that was blocking the output from the duct. But in relation to Sjogren's, the issue is that the acenic cells that make the saliva are damaged. And if you do a scan or an X-ray, um, Often uh, uh, we would do a specific X-ray, which is called cytography, where we would inject a radio pig uh, stain or a dye into the duct and into the gland. And you see that all the structure of the gland is, is actually destroyed like a snowstorm. Um, I haven't heard of anybody doing it in Ireland, and I yeah, haven't heard of the expert um, he was from uh, the Netherlands, and he said because you're not getting the flush out from normal slivery flow, right. it can happen that there's buildup stasis and, yeah and that it is helpful for some people yeah. and i just and he said it's minimally invasive it's yeah. you know and it can work really well for some people so that might be something to like look into into the future yeah yeah absolutely mm. um it certainly wouldn't do any harm you exactly know, yeah 
as long as it's being done by somebody who knows what they're doing because you don't want to push oral bacteria yes. that are inside the oral cavity up into the duct either because stasis and infections within the salivary glands because of the low output can be a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do we have time? We might ask Sharon a question. I don't know. Uh, and we've Caroline as well, Joan. Perfect. Um, yeah. Hi. Yeah, no, so my, my question is, it's it's a bit strange. So I've had like dry mouth for years and, you know, diagnosed with Sjogren's. But more recently, I've noticed that at night I've started to drill. And so I wake up with almost like gunk. Um, it's sticky and it's just it's a new symptom. Like I, I, I was diagnosed with Sjogren's probably back in like 2008. So it's something new. Is it something that you've come across or anything to be concerned about or... Um, it is something that I've come across. Um, it, it's a strange one because it's counterintuitive because we produce even less saliva at nighttime. So most patients um, that actually, actually have Sjogren's, you know, will find that they often complain that it's like waking up in the Sahara Desert, your tongue is really dry and it's sticking to your palate and some people's lips are sticking to their teeth etc mm -hmm. but I actually find myself that I I actually have a little bit of drool um it's all here yeah it seems to be on the side that you sleep on um even though the rest of the mouth is absolutely really parched you know so what I would recommend doing is I would recommend putting a bit of vaseline on the skin to stop the skin from getting irritated by the drool um you really can't stop it. It's just that you're staying in the one position and, and the small amount of saliva that you are producing is actually leaking out. As well as that, when you're asleep and you're relaxed, you're, it, it means that your lips are not normally sealed. And it, it's it's actually, um, like if, I suppose if, if I went to the back to the book, which is the shut your mouth and breathe, he uses extreme um, options. Like he, he tapes people's mouths actually shut at nighttime. Obviously don't do this if you sleep apnea or anything. And if, if you taped your mouth, it definitely would stop this um, egress of, a, mm -hmm. of the small amount of saliva that you, you are producing. Okay. But, but it, 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 it is a strange one, but it certainly does happen. I think looking after the skin around that area of the mouth by actually protecting it with lubricant yeah. um, will stop it being an issue. Because I've been getting like irritation all down here. Yeah. It's, it's a thing recent I, thing. Like I'll yeah. still be dry in the morning, but it's, yeah. yeah. One thing I find is that um, Neutrogena hand cream is a fantastic barrier cream. Okay. And I, I use it on lips and I use it on skin. And it's also extremely inexpensive. And we have Caroline um, had her hand up. So, um, Caroline, would you like to ask your question? Caroline McMahon? Hello, how are you? I'm also from Cork as well. And I'm really delighted to see Eleanor Sullivan there. That's my story okay. is my father was a dentist. My teeth were well looked after, but they were soft, so soft, they would crumble even on a piece of white bread, not even toasted. Anyway, got the chogans, all the rest. I had a doctor or not a dentist up here in uh, when I lived up in Dublin. Even though I moved to Cork 20 years ago, I still came up. I came up every three months, every six months. My teeth were just literally everything I, I had and every bit of money has gone into them. But with the shoguns, what happened is we've had the root canals, we've had all the posts and uh, uh, pins and all the rest. Anyway, they've all started to snap at the root level. Mm -hmm. So then I've gone down the implant and I've had uh, three implants. And about a year ago, I said, look, I can't do it. I turned 60. I said, can't do this anymore. It's cost an arm leg. I went in somewhere and said, look, what about taking them out? They said, yeah, you have some very good ones there. Maybe we'll do a series of implants and all the rest. Anyway, unfortunately, I had a plate in C5 and C6 due to a spinal injury. So oh, that was kicking up. So look, the heel of the haunt is, they said, just hold fire. But really, and honestly, and I think everybody will re regards the shogans and their teeth, where do you go? Who actually knows? Even with 30 years of my dentist up in Dublin, he never made any acknowledgement with the showgrounds. It was never a thing. It, it was only people a year ago had said to me about that fancy toothpaste. Now I have the showgrounds, probably had it 30 years, but officially diagnosed about 13 years. So nobody, and even going to COH to see the rheumatologist there, nobody, nobody ever once asked about your teeth. How are your teeth? Where were they? Like my teeth were everything, but nobody asked 
mm. tea was never mentioned. It was like it was a word that never came in. No, I I absolutely can hear your frustration. And I'm really sorry that it has been such a horrible journey for you. But I'm not surprised, to be honest with you. Um, like, again, I've had arthritis since I was in my early 20s. Yes. So I know that I think once you actually... I think once you have any kind of a chronic disease, I, th I, I think we have a fantastic health service in relation to acute things. I think once yeah. you're diagnosed with any autoimmune kind of chronic things, you're expected that, you know, this you is just it. it. Exactly. Get on with it and you accept it. You know, so I think people can come get a small bit blind and not, I suppose, listen, I, I suppose this is why this group is so important because I think, somebody has to speak up and i think it starts with the patient unfortunately it shouldn't have to but i yeah, think yeah. that it's by the patients starting to raise awareness and the patients this is why i said in my talk if you have sjogren's if you have dry mouth if you have ulcers speak up and make your symptoms known ask for help yes we shouldn't have to ask for help we shouldn't have to speak up but unfortunately if we don't we're the ones who suffer mm -hmm. it sounds like you've had sjogren's for 30 years and unfortunately um you should have had you know an awful lot of care an awful lot of home care this is mainly home care home care for the eyes home care for our brain home care for the teeth yeah, it's yeah. it's the stuff but you need to be led in the right direction this is where if there's you know? somewhere you can go as you say yeah you are led. and i mean i'm fortunate a retired nurse but have been working because i had the bad spinal injury yeah 20 years ago i even yeah. in desperation um because i was becoming you know turning 30, uh, 30 60 in 2000 um two years ago i even went to this it saved the money went to boston and went to the shogun's foundation thing mm -hmm. and do you know what the nicest thing about it was when you walked into a room there was a sea of 500 people with shogun's and i actually thought do you know what i'm not a freak i'm not a thing you know somebody is yeah. leaving because even my own gp until i brought her back the stuff and whole all the literature and she says, oh, so basically, and I've been attending her for the last 15 years. Oh, this is real. So you have to think, mm -hmm. and not that I go mm -hmm. often to the GP because I accept diagnose and do. Mm -hmm. And when you're shelving out 60 euros, it pop. You have done all the over-the-counters. As a result, I've ended up, due to the it's chronic illness, many times ending up actually in CUH, actually in the ICU, because I self diagnosed I had pile nephritis, I'd, um, they thought a stroke of brain, but it was inflammation of the brain. You know, I had all the other things because I didn't, I didn't know where to go. The GP didn't take it on board. And I just, I suppose, um, left um, it to that stage. Sorry. Um, I think what you've said is really, really important. I, I, I would say um, at last, you now have a new um, space and you, you know, have an Irish tribe that you're now a part of. You don't have to go to the States to Boston in order to find other people who actually understand. Um, and I think that you raised an awful lot of important things, you know, access to healthcare, access to people who will listen to you. But again, it, it comes back to the importance of this group and the importance of making our issues, making your issues, making your symptoms, making your wishes heard and making the information also heard you know, sharing the information. Thank, thank you, Lorna. Thank, thank you so much, Eleanor. And, and I can see that Deirdre has put in the chat also that, you know, Sjogren's Ireland is, is really the home for hopefully all, all, all uh, patients to uh, meet and organise events and, and get the kind of support that it's so clear that uh, Sjogren's patients do need. So with uh, five minutes remaining, we have, um, I, I, uh, I'm really delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Michelle Flood. Firstly, I just want to thank everybody so much for coming today. I suppose I'm attending as the academic lead for the PPI or CSI. So I work with Lorna and other people to try and help promote and help support events like this. So delighted to have a part in today's um, group. I'm hesitant to say too much more because I think what Caroline has shared, and thank you so much, Caroline, for sharing that story. I'm not a Sjogren's researcher, I'm a health service researcher. So you know, I see different problems with, with your story that, you know, need to be addressed. But the main thing that we want to do is try and make sure that people like yourselves have an active voice in research, because what's researched, you know, obviously depends on, you know, a lot of factors and traditionally it had, you know, largely depended on what other people had done and you would try and take the next step, you know, on top of something you'd already done. But through working with patients, we can take a better step so maybe the next logical one is not the right one so we can focus our efforts 
and things that really matter and really might make a difference. And I think Joan is a particular leading light and the work that herself and Deirdre has done is exemplary and really, really commended. And we're really looking to provide any support we can in, in terms of what we might be able to do from an RCSI perspective. And I suppose for those of you who have a wider interest in, in becoming involved in various things at the university, at RCSI, we're, I suppose, particularly um, focused on uh, contributing towards the UN SDGs, particularly around health. So we do that in different ways. So what Joan has described today, patient public involvement in research. And then what I feel is really important, what I've learned so much today is really about the patient experience. So we'll often seek um, you know, help through uh, you know, networks like your own to identify patients who come in and talk to our students while they're still learning. So they will understand not just you know, what Chogun's disease is or you know, whatever you know, the, the preferred terminology is for your own group, you can let me know about that when you decide it, but you know that actually you're speaking directly to the next generation. And as someone, I'm a pharmacist by original background and things to stay with me from when I used to practice are not you know, memorizing all the drugs. It's the stories that I heard in people's experiences of illness and you know, what could I have done in any tiny way to make that better for them is, is always what motivated me. Um, we also arrange relatively frequent um, events at RCSI that people might uh, like to, to keep an eye out for. And if you email engage at rcsi.ie, um, you can uh, just join a mailing list and they'll let you know. But I suppose the thing I take away from today is next time I'd love more time to hear your stories and to hear and learn more from your own experiences. And I'm sure there'll be an opportunity to do that again soon. But I just want to say congratulations to uh, Joan and Deirdre for organising this um, fab event with input from Grania. And thanks so much to Lorna um, for providing all the expert PPI um, event and to uh, Dr. Elner and Dr. Brennan uh, for um, contributing uh, such great, such great um, information to the event today. So I can pass back to Joan then, if that's, if that's OK. Perfect. I'd again, just echo the same things. I'd like to thank absolutely everybody who was involved. Um, all of our everyone who attended and everyone who shared with us either you know through the comment box as you have done there caroline to turn on your camera and say your words and share your stories with us that is is kind of the burden of the heart and that is what drives the change and it is hearing hearing those stories they do help shape what we do and and hopefully improve healthcare. care um, today wouldn't have happened without as i say it takes a village um, you see what you what you see up front there's a lot of things going on behind so i would like to thank everyone who attended if you if you don't come and talk to us and tell us what you would like to see done then then these events won't happen so you coming and attending and staying part of the network joining um Shogun's Ireland will help see future events and um, also the people in the background we have our PPI team all of the teams in RCSI the comms team the designs team the Shogun's patient group I'm sure there's a ton of people I'm going to forget but it literally there are so many people that were um, we need to thank um who helped us get here and the generosity of spirit and expertise and skills all of our guest speakers, everyone who contributed to the leaflets, all do so um, because they are passionate about increasing awareness about Sjogren's syndrome, about raising awareness of the condition and about the need for education. So I'd just like to thank absolutely everybody who's helped um, ourselves as researchers and the Sjogren's Island group to get where we are today. Thank you so much, Joan. And, and if I could ask people to turn on their cameras, if they're comfortable to do so, we would love to take a, a group uh, photograph to kind of this is our very first um, public patient involvement knowledge exchange event that's been co-designed with the patient organization we would like in the future at RCSI to have many more events like this co-designed with patients around other conditions as well so it's really helpful I think for the public to know that this is you know a, a new and strong movement so if you're happy to turn on your camera please do or if, if you need, need to, to leave if you don't want your name to be part of the photograph then, then now would be a good time just before I ask Martha to take uh, the, their final photograph I just want to acknowledge Dr Joan Nigan Drum Gould because there are many researchers who are involved in PPI but there are very few researchers who are as dynamic and driven and committed and committed as, as Joan is and as I'm sure you appreciate the amount of energy it takes to organize such a large event like this with expert speakers and showcasing um, so much knowledge in such a short period of time and in particular to do it in an online space is very challenging so I, I would just love if we would all uh, show Joan our love that might be waving your hands it might be uh, pressing your reaction buttons and putting a love heart button um, but 
really, Joan, you, you've really uh, co-created um, a, a community with Deirdre Collins, and I would love Deirdre to unmute and maybe say a couple of final words before we take our photograph. Thanks, Deirdre. Hi. Yeah, I just want to say, um, I suppose it's just it's just really, really exciting. I suppose you kind of got a glimpse today of what we can do together when, you know, we get all these patients involved um, and we're listened to and we felt heard. And, you know, I think it was wonderful to hear from speakers who are so, so enthusiastic. And the fact that some of them have showrooms as well, so you're getting that personal experience. Um, I think the whole experience is very positive. And I think it's a great kind of step forward for what we can do in the future. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Deirdre, for your commitment and your energy. Um, really, really appreciate uh, the important role that Children's Ireland are, are playing in the collaboration with RCSI. Um, thanks for working with us. <laughs> <laughs> Very great pleasure. Um, and uh, many thanks to, to Michelle and, and to Eleanor and to Spina. And um, also a very warm thank you to Martha Killaly from uh, the PPI Ignite office in, in Galway, who's been behind the scene and um, helping everything run smoothly. So thank you very much, Martha.